It was just a job. You were meant to be mopping floors and cleaning toilets at the Johnston Labs and Pharmaceuticals Research Center for minimum wage. And you were happy about it. Grateful for any kind of employment. You didn't even know that the company signing your checks was the SCP Foundation, an organization dedicated to securing and containing anomalies and protecting humanity from their negative effects at any cost. And today, you're going to find out exactly how steep that cost can be. The Johnston Labs and Pharmaceuticals Research Center isn't actually a research center at all. It's a foundation front business, with a building solely dedicated to the containment of a single anomaly. SCP-3280. But again, you're just the janitor. It's not like they would bother telling you what's being contained here. If it breaks out, you won't even know what's killing you until it's too late. It begins, like most classic horror stories, on a dark and stormy night. You're mopping up a silent hallway, whistling a little tune to yourself, when rain starts hammering down on the window next to you. Not long after, you see a bolt of lightning split the distant sky, followed by an immense thundercrack. Soon after, you hear screaming and panicking from below, frantic footsteps, then the flashing lights and sirens. You think back to your employee orientation. These flashing lights and wailing sirens can only mean one thing, containment breach. You run for it, not even knowing what you're running from. You bring your mop and bucket with you, perhaps just out of habit, you seek refuge in the only place in the facility that truly seems to belong to you, the broom closet. The alarm blares as you lock yourself in the closet. You're shaking with terror and can hear the screaming of your colleagues. You hear more noises, running, scrambling, a wet dripping sound, gunshots, and then silence. All this time you can't help but wonder, why isn't anybody coming to help us? After a while, the only thing you can hear is the rain and the distant thunder. It's been hours. You've only managed to stave off dehydration by drinking the filthy water from the mop sink. But at least it seems like the chaos outside has died down. Carefully, you open the door and peek out of the closet. Darkness, but no detectable movement. Now's your chance and you make a break for it, creeping down the hall. The dark hallway is suddenly lit up by lightning and you can see that there are bodies everywhere. You step over the corpse of Dr. Cothrone, one of the few scientists working here who actually knew your name. If you can make it to the security office, you might be able to radio for help, or maybe access a computer terminal. On the way to the office, you hear another horrific scream start to echo through the complex before it's cut off by a thunderclap. You have to ignore it though, and push on. When you enter the security room, you see that the head security officer, Nichols, is already dead. His body has been cut open from neck to groin, gutted. The anomaly, whatever it is, has already been here. You access the computer terminal and open the file for SCP-3280. You're warned that as janitorial staff, you have level zero clearance, and as a result, information will be omitted from the files you access. It doesn't matter. You press on and open up the file. Both the object class and the description have been redacted. You can only see the special containment procedures. They dictate that 3280 is to remain contained at the Johnston Labs and Pharmaceuticals Research Center until long-term containment procedures can be drawn up. If the entity ever reaches beyond sublevel 2, the facility enters full lockdown mode. Not even information is allowed in or out of the facility as this could result in an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. In other words, nobody is coming to save you. The only other information on the page is a picture of a lightning storm, much like the one you find yourself in right now. Lightning flashes in the hall. You dart around paranoid, knowing the anomaly could be anywhere. All you can hear now is the quiet drip, drip, drip of blood coming from the body of Security Officer Nichols. Whatever this thing had done to him looked painful. You try to remember him as he was in life, and then a revelation hits you. A security officer probably has a lot better clearance than a janitor. You feel around Nichols' mutilated torso until you find his keycard. Thankfully, Nichols was the kind of guy who'd write his password on the underside of this card so he wouldn't forget it. You easily gain access to the Foundation servers with his login credentials. You now have level 2 security clearance. 
The terminal gives you the option to view security footage taken throughout the site. You're given access to every camera still working after the containment breach and the subsequent carnage. You select the camera feed for the second floor barracks. There you see researcher Jensen hanging from a makeshift noose attached to his bunk. There's a puddle underneath his corpse. You access the feed from the second floor east wing. There you see Dr. Emanuel stumbling down a dark corridor. His movements are oddly listless, like he's in a trance. Suddenly there's another flash of lightning and a crack of thunder. Dr. Emanuel clutches his gut in pain and crumples to the floor. You access the camera feed from the first floor entrance. It seems that the whole area is flooded. Is this because of the storm? In a panic, many lower tier staff members had tried to escape, defying the lockdown protocols and the special containment procedures. Now they're floating face down in the water, all dead. You access the camera feed from sublevel two and see another corpse lying in the corner. He's wearing an orange jumpsuit, D-class. No idea why he was down there. The only other notable thing in the basement was a burst pipe, leaking and spraying more water everywhere. With trembling fingers, you select the camera feed for the first floor cafeteria. The whole room is practically underwater. The only evidence of the massacre that must have taken place are the fragments of clothing floating on the surface of the water. That, and the fleshy pink slurry forming at the bottom of the windows. It reminds you of the gooey meat runoff in chicken nugget factories. You close your eyes and try to center yourself. It's violent chaos. Looking at more of it isn't getting you anywhere. Instead, you put those new level 2 security access credentials to good use and hop back onto the file for SCP-3280. You think to yourself, there has to be something I can use on here. But even as you wait for the file to load, some part of you knows that time is running out for you. Perhaps it's the stress, or the fear, or the filthy mop water you drank. But you're feeling the pressure start to mount, physically. Your stomach is beginning to ache. You can see blurry shapes moving in the corners of your eyes. It's getting harder to focus your vision, and harder still to quiet the terrified voices in your mind. But you can't get up, not without knowing what is doing this to you. The containment class for SCP-3280 is now declassified, Euclid, and once more, the special containment procedures have altered too. They now explain that every week, a new member of D-Class personnel is to be deposited into the entity's lair in sublevel 2 through subterranean access point Gamma. The D-Class, or more accurately, the Sacrifices, are to be told lies about why exactly they need to descend to the lowest point in the facility. They're even given a working flashlight and a defensive nightstick to create the illusion that the Foundation expects them to ever return from the depths. Little do they know, they also have a tiny transmitter sewn into their jumpsuit. This broadcasts a frequency that will attract an eager SCP-3280 to the D-Class's location, like a dinner bell only it can hear. The file specifies that SCP-3280 always prefers live prey. Well, at least that explains the dead D-Class in sublevel 2, you think, hoping that it will somehow overwhelm the dizziness you're feeling, or the nagging pain in your gut. You read on. Somehow the file's tone becomes even more severe. It says that failure to maintain the containment of SCP-3280 will not only trigger a lockdown, it will always call in the intervention of two different mobile task forces, MTF IOTA-12, The Silencers, and Tau-4, also known as Water Water Everywhere. If 12 hours pass from the point of initial containment breach and the O5 Council hasn't been given the all-clear signal by one of these teams, preparation begins for an imminent XK-class end of the world scenario. Just reading the words sends you into a cold sweat. End of the world? What on earth is this creature? Finally, you reach the description. You get to find out what this horrifying entity actually is. But the last thing you expect is the first sentence in the file to read, SCP-3280 is a sapient entity composed of a fluid physically identical to water, capable of traveling roughly two and a half kilometers per hour. It's water. It's literally a living, thinking blob of water. As you read on, the concerning details pile up. Any water that the anomalous SCP-3280 water touches, it integrates it into its own mass. But any time water is separated from this mass, it remains anomalous. 
and continues to act independently. When the creature was first discovered, it was a mere 66.4 liters in volume. Now it's around 2,500. The water infected by SCP-3280 is hostile to all humans, and not just in a defensive manner. SCP-3280 will actively seek out human prey, and when it finds them, it forces its mass into any available body orifice, including the victim's pores. This can happen in such a subtle manner that you may not even notice yourself being infiltrated. But below this, the file has a list of symptoms for those experiencing 3280 infiltration, loss of motor control, weakening of the micturition reflex, visual hallucinations, and abdominal pain. As you read the words, your stomach gives another painful churn, almost like something is moving around inside of you. It's all coming together. You read on. The file states that SCP-3280 is so difficult to contain because it exhibits claustrophobic tendencies. Any time it's placed inside a container, whether organic or inorganic, it escapes with pressurized water jets that travel at over 255 miles per hour. If the water is inside a human, it may literally explode out of them, killing them in the process. Your jittering eyes turn to the gutted body of Security Officer Nichols. It all makes sense now. Everything is becoming clear as the pain in your stomach builds in its intensity. The file goes on to say that if SCP-3280 escapes sublevel 2, it may be impossible to contain again. If 3280 ever escaped the site proper, it would indeed cause an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario to unfold, as 3280 merged with our water cycle and destroyed all of humanity on a global scale. It would become truly impossible for anyone to escape. You can't read anymore. The pain in your stomach is unbearable. You jerk from your seat and stumble out into the hall, doubled over in agony. You can feel it pulsing in there, fighting its way out. It must have gotten in through the filthy mop water you were drinking. You didn't even know it, but your fate has been sealed for hours. You've been a dead man walking. The hum of pain builds in your ears and renders you almost deaf. All you can hear is the pattern of rain and distant thunder. You collapse against the glass, feeling the coolness of it against the skin of your face. And in that moment, you see the water droplets on the window pane reverse direction. They're slithering up the glass towards your face in defiance of gravity. Then you realize it's all over. And not just for you. SCP-3280 has escaped. It's out there and it's going to drown the entire world. As you collapse to your knees and prepare to be torn apart from the inside, your final thought is that at least you won't be alive to see it. Jack was swimming deep underwater, wondering why he had such a pounding headache when suddenly he had a terrifying realization. He had no idea where he was or what he was doing. There was a nagging feeling that he must have a specific reason to be here. You don't just end up deep in the ocean with a diving suit on by chance. Yet he had no idea what he was supposed to be doing. He wasn't sure he cared either. He was more worried about the throbbing pain in his head and the vision of two eyes staring at him out of the dark that he couldn't get out of his mind. His heart began to race as he wondered what to do and how to get help. He was in the middle of the ocean and appeared to be all alone. He couldn't see anything in the dark water except for this weird gray substance in front of him. Maybe he was going to die here alone. Without knowing if anyone could even hear him, he began to speak aloud about how he was consumed by sickness and that darkness was all around him. This is the story of one of the most powerful and dangerous anomalies yet discovered, SCP-3000. Before Jack's descent into despair, the SCP Foundation had mandated an exploratory expedition off the coast of Bangladesh. After receiving a few strange reports from locals and fishermen, the Foundation suspected an SCP was lurking in the water and positioned a few personnel to investigate. The crew expected danger, or maybe even death. But what they got instead was far stranger and more ominous. All of the men had been verified to be in sound mental states when the mission set out, but a few of them reported feeling strange and uneasy as the submarine descended into the ocean. Before long, a veteran agent named Dr. Williams began to panic in a way that was completely out of character. 
He started sweating profusely, shaking, and wouldn't listen to a word of comfort or reason that anybody tried to offer. It might seem like a relatively normal reaction for anyone descending into the depths of the ocean to meet with a monster that they don't know anything about, but Dr. Williams was a seasoned professional who had been on hundreds of such missions before. There was no logical reason for him to act like this. Although the reaction of Dr. Williams was the most extreme, he wasn't the only one who started to feel strange. Multiple agents developed a creeping feeling of unease that swept over them. One of the calmer men tried to reason with Dr. Williams, asking him what was wrong and if he could explain exactly how he was feeling. That's when things got even stranger. Not only was the doctor extremely anxious, but he now seemed incapable of giving a real response to any questions thrown at him. He could only mutter that he was missing something, but he wasn't sure what. Knowing that many SCPs can bend reality and the human mind, many of the personnel began to have second thoughts about the mission and even asked for permission to call off the mission, but they were mandated to continue, so they went on. As the team went deeper and deeper into the ocean, things only got worse. Even the previously calm crew members became spooked and antsy, while the ones who were already anxious were now sweating and jittering. As for Dr. Williams, he was now pacing back and forth around the submarine, saying things nobody could understand. Every time he looked at his colleagues and his close friends, he seemed to stare straight through them and would call them by the wrong names. It was as if his mind had moved to a different dimension. Whenever someone asked him to perform his normal duties, he looked more confused than ever. Still, the team went deeper. Dr. Williams began to whimper and say the word no repeatedly, growing louder and louder until he was screaming and the others were forced to sedate him. Just then, something came into view. It was what would come to be known as SCP-3000. The thing was huge, so huge that its whole body couldn't be seen out of the submarine window. It was a horrible, eel-looking creature with a head as big as a town and haunting eyes that lit up the black ocean around it. But perhaps the strangest part was this giant eel seemed to be producing a weird gray liquid. Even the sedative wasn't enough to keep Dr. Williams calm anymore. There was a strange blank look in his eyes as if the light and life had left him, and he just began screaming no repeatedly again and wouldn't respond to any attempts to calm him down. Not that anyone else was very capable of calming him down at this point. Even the crew members that had been holding up well were starting to act strangely, and nobody could get the image of these ominous eyes out of their heads. Then things went from bad to worse. Williams began screaming and shouting madly as if he was being tortured by an unseen force. The men tried to restrain him, but it was no use. He began smashing his head against the submarine window until it cracked, putting the whole mission and everyone's life at risk. He fell to the ground injured, chanting that there was nothing, whatever that meant. It was an emergency scenario. They began applying first aid to Williams as the submarine ascended to the surface as quickly as possible before the pressure of the ocean caused the cracked window to explode. By the time they reached the surface, Williams was dead. But there was something even more chilling than the circumstances of his death. Every single man who had been in that submarine experienced the same thing on the days that came afterward. The image of the eel-like creature's eyes seemed burned in their minds permanently. It would haunt their waking hours for the rest of their lives, and sleep was no escape either, as they would appear in both their dreams and nightmares alike forever. A second mission had to be sent to gather more information about the strange beast. Already, there were many theories and question marks surrounding SCP-3000. How big was it really? Was it sentient? What was the liquid for? None of the men who had been on the previous mission were willing to return to the waters, but a new group of brave recruits volunteered. They were about to find out what so many in history have learned the hard way, that bravery and foolishness are often mistaken for the same thing. This time, the mission would not be in a submarine, but in dive suits, in order to observe the anomaly in even closer detail and to eliminate the chance of one team member self-sabotaging the submarine, killing them all. They were transported to the location by boat, and the three men splashed into the ocean. They descended, and at first everything was going well. In case anything went wrong, the three of them were tethered together for extra security. But the deeper into the ocean they swam, and the closer they got to SCP-3000's location they got, the stranger things became, just like on the last mission. First, there were a few minor cases of confusion. One of the team, Jack, thought it was his responsibility to lead the navigation, but another, Roberto, also thought it was his job. In fact, navigation was actually the job of a third team member, Amir, but he seemed to have forgotten. 
Everyone was getting confused. The team listening in on the conversations at the Foundation headquarters grew increasingly concerned about what they could hear. Was everyone losing their minds? Hopefully, nobody was about to pull another Dr. Williams on them. Still, the project leads couldn't afford to tell the men to come back to the surface. The Foundation badly needed any information they could get on this SCP, whatever the cost, so they told the men to press on. Things only got worse. Roberto was asking to speak to a colleague who passed away two years ago, while the others began to mutter indistinguishable phrases about eyes and darkness, not too dissimilar to the ramblings of Dr. Williams. It increasingly began to look like a suicide mission. Then there was silence. What was going on? Each of the men had completely lost it to the point that they cut the tether that was holding them together. All alone, Jack couldn't remember where he was or why he was here. He desperately looked around to try and gauge his surroundings, but he could only see darkness. All he could think about was a pair of large eyes and an overwhelming fear of despair and anxiety, and this weird gray fluid that was now floating in front of him. The Foundation listened as Jack started reciting a creepy speech about being on the edge of nothing, inches from oblivion, with a sickness in his mind and nothing but a pair of eyes in front of him. They listened in horror as they heard movement through the radio. It sounded like a huge creature was swimming toward the men. It had to be SCP-3000, but all three men were too confused to do anything about the situation or to even see what was in front of them, claiming they couldn't see anything in the darkness. There was silence for half a minute with the team listening in, fearing the worst. Then they heard some more unintelligible mutterings. The men must be alive, but what on earth was going on? Then the gibberish started again. Two of the men were screaming that Jack had just been swallowed whole and that they were being sucked in too. Why couldn't they just swim away? It was chaos. But then a few moments later, Roberto spoke into the radio, saying he was floating alone in the middle of the ocean and had now moved away from the eyes of SCP-3000. He finally seemed capable of forming coherent thoughts and speech. After what had just happened, Roberto now had a theory. He thought that somehow it was impossible to think straight around SCP-3000. When he'd been close enough to see the eyes, Roberto had felt a throbbing pain in his brain and been unable to think about anything. Perhaps it was something to do with that mysterious gray liquid. Even more slime was coming out of SCP-3000 now, and Roberto was determined to get a sample despite the warnings from HQ. In one final burst of motivation, he swam close enough to take some of the gray liquid and put it in a special sample collection unit that was designed to float to the surface for collection later. He had acquired some very important data, but he seemed to have lost all hope of preserving his life. Roberto started telling the team over the radio that he was dying and that his heart rate was too high, but cautioned that it would be too dangerous for anyone to try and rescue him. The personnel continued to try and communicate with Roberto to figure out what was going on, but his words had stopped making any sense until finally he went quiet. Minutes turned into hours, hours into days, and still there was no sign of Roberto or the rest of the divers. After three days, his radio, which had only been sending a steady stream of static, finally stopped working altogether and he was presumed dead. However, the sample Roberto had collected had survived and made it to the hands of the Foundation researchers. It turned out to be a viscous substance now known as Y909, a chemical compound and extremely strong anesthesia. Y909 causes head pain, paranoia, fear, panic, memory loss, and confusion, explaining what happened to Dr. Williams and the diving trio. The collection of Y909 might have resulted in two disastrous missions, but there's a silver lining as the substance ended up becoming an invaluable tool for the SCP Foundation. Its ability to make people forget what had just happened to them can be used to eliminate knowledge of threatening SCPs among the public. It also helps the Foundation staff cope with the traumatic experiences they encounter on their missions. Although other amnestics can be used for the same purpose, none are as powerful as the one produced by SCP-3000. Before its discovery, the amnestics used would break down too quickly, not fare well in storage, or cause undesirable side effects. The only problem is the method of sourcing. The only way to obtain Y909 is somewhat ethically questionable for most people. SCP-3000 produces Y909 after eating, so the best way to stock up on it is by feeding the creature. Sedated D-Class personnel from the Foundation are sent on missions supposedly to observe the anomaly up close, unaware that this mission is one way only. Other divers are then sent later to collect the fluid from a safe distance and store it. Of course, it's all for the greater good of humanity. Now, the Foundation protects SCP-3000 as best as it can guard something hundreds of kilometers long. The area is carefully patrolled and members of the public are not allowed to enter the part of the bay where it resides. Anybody who accidentally comes into contact is contained. Eventually, another pair of Foundation doctors went down in a submarine to try and learn more about SCP-3000. 
One became so affected by Y909 that he began hallucinating. He started talking about Ananta Shesha, the king of serpents in Hinduism. Ananta Shesha is believed to be all that will be left after the end of the world because it exists throughout all of time simultaneously. The doctor said he believed that this was in fact Ananta Shesha, that SCP-3000 simply shows us that eventually everyone dies and fades into the darkness of oblivion, right before he exited the submarine and swam right into his mouth. Luckily for now, SCP-3000 seems to be in a sort of hibernation state. It rarely moves and it doesn't hunt, although it will eat when fed. But no one knows when or if it'll wake, or what it's capable of if it does. Will it destroy the world, or simply drive us all insane? Commander McGrath, one of the most influential members of Mobile Task Force Alpha-1, better known as the Red Right Hand, had been summoned by his masters for one of the most important missions of his life. It was so above top secret, even he would likely need to undergo amnestic treatment once he'd seen the job through. It comes with the territory when you're dealing with SCP-006. The Red Right Hand is no ordinary mobile task force either. They were the personal enforcers of the O5 Council, the 13 most powerful members of the SCP Foundation, and by extension, some of the most powerful human beings on Earth. Commander McGrath stood before the assembled council, trying to suppress the tremors of fear and awe running through him. He'd gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with SCP-076 Abel, one of the finest humanoid warriors ever known, during one of his many containment breaches. He led strike forces after a fleeing SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile, after it escaped its acid tank and began charging towards the nearest populated area intent on causing mass death. He'd personally taken out more people than you've probably ever met, all at the behest of his Foundation's superiors. And yet standing right here before them, he couldn't help feel a twinge of deep terror. It was like staring right into the face of God and waiting for it to blink. With his well-honed military observation skills, he noted that O5-2 wasn't among the Council this time. But he knew better than to ask why. Mm -hmm. He was employed to take orders, not to ask questions. And this time, his orders were something special. He wasn't given any more information than this. McGrath, we need you to lead an elite team to a Strachan in Russia on the double. Procedure 006 is now in effect. You know what to do. McGrath nodded. Mm -hmm. He'd been prepared for this day. His predecessor, Commander Richards, had only needed to enact Procedure 006 once in his long and storied career with the Red Right Hand. It was truly a once-in-a-lifetime assignment, and now the torch had been passed to him. The only question was whether he'd be up to the task, but McGrath didn't have time to ponder on this question. Time was of the essence. First, he needed to assemble a team, small but focused, Loyal men who'd keep their heads down, complete the mission, and take the forbidden knowledge no further than the bounds of said mission. McGrath selected three operatives, Bennett, DiMaggio, and Stewart, all of whom had proven valuable assets in prior missions. They would be the ones to accompany him on this most valuable and secretive of directives, Procedure 006. But before they could execute the mission itself, they needed to be trained, briefed, and fitted with the proper equipment. For a mission this sensitive, and dealing with an anomaly as deadly as SCP-006, they needed to wear modified Class 6 BNC suits. These are the ultimate total exclusion hazmat suits, designed specifically by the SCP Foundation. They offered such a degree of protection that they made regular hazmat suits look like bikinis. Commander McGrath actually knew very little about SCP-006 and how it worked. Like many of the more top-secret anomalies contained by the Foundation, only the O5 Council understood the full scope of it. Everyone below them were only told the specific fragments of information they needed to do their job. After all, filling your head with the wrong kinds of knowledge can get your memory wiped, or worse, at the SCP Foundation. SCP-006, as far as Commander McGrath knew, was the more traditional kind of toxic. He'd been briefed using the SCP-006-B info pack, a heavily redacted description of SCP-006. Safe class, liquid in nature, but one of the most toxic substances known to man. It made mercury and uranium look like a glass of mineral water. And more dangerous still, if someone came into contact with even the tiniest quantity of SCP-006's liquids, they would not only be marked for certain death, 
They would also become a vector for transmission, a veritable plague rat, a walking danger to all mankind. That's why the Class 6 BNC suits needed to be tested. McGrath, Bennett, DiMaggio, and Stewart suited up in a secure foundation training facility and fully submerged themselves in a training pool. This was how they made sure that there were no vulnerabilities in the suits. If any bubbles were generated, it meant there was a leak. And if there was a leak, then the person wearing the defective suit was as good as dead when they reached the real 006. Lucky for them, no leaks. They were ready to proceed to the next stage of the mission, making their way to Astrakhan, Russia, where SCP-006 was contained. The pressure was on, with the Council growing more impatient by the moment, so they needed to make the journey immediately. Every minute counted, and Commander McGrath was painfully aware of the time slipping away. Though he couldn't possibly fathom why they need a toxic chemical like this with such urgency, they made their journey in a covert cargo plane. It was beyond important to keep all Foundation activity around SCP-006 under wraps. A number of groups of interest cells were active in the area, including the Church of the Broken God and the Serpent's Hand. And if ever the dreaded Chaos Insurgency caught wind of SCP-006's existence and triangulated its location, the damage it could do would be unprecedented. That's why nobody but the O5 Council could truly be trusted with this almost sacred knowledge. When they touched down in Astrakhan, they met with a Foundation courier who would take them on the final leg of their journey to the Foundation site, roughly 60 kilometers west of the town. McGrath and his team had no idea what they were headed towards, or the insane history of the land they traversed, all because of SCP-006. The Foundation had first become aware of the anomaly back during the 19th century, but were unable to gain control of it until 1991 due to it being fiercely guarded by a procession of territorial Russian rulers. The blood of hundreds of thousands had been spilled on this land in the historic wars and conflicts over SCP-006. So many had wasted their entire lives unsuccessfully trying to find it. During this several-hour car trip to the site, Commander McGrath had no idea of the true value of the anomaly he and his small team were heading towards. But he would, in time though an innocent would have to die first. The courier dropped the four operatives off outside an abandoned chemical plant in the sticks, far from what anyone would call civilization. It was the kind of industrial decay you could expect in the badlands of rural Russia, a huge complex weathered and broken by time. But what the untrained observer wouldn't realize is that the plant was actually full of heavily trained and even more heavily armed Foundation security personnel. As McGrath's team approached the building, they had no less than eight sniper rifles pointed at them from various vantage points within the plant, just to be safe. The Foundation couldn't afford to take any chances with SCP-006. They arrived at the gate and provided their clearance credentials. They were envoys, here on behalf of the O5 Council themselves, and if they weren't allowed to complete their mission, then the 006 personnel would have the death of a council member on their hands. With that, the team was given a free pass into the site, under close observation. Anyone seeking to interface SCP-006 was forced to do so under almost microscopic scrutiny. Even when inside the building, McGrath and his men needed to pass multiple secure checkpoints throughout the halls, each time restating their security credentials. Eventually, they reached a different section of the building, foreboding anomalous hallways gave way to what seemed like a mix of a garden and a jungle. But the plants were… different. The trees, the shrubs, even the weeds were unlike anything members of the team had ever seen before. It was like stepping into an alien world, or perhaps this world, but as it was a few million years prior, it was terrifying and wondrous. They suited up in their Class 6 BNC suits, fearing airborne contaminants from SCP-006 before proceeding further. They walked through this new jungle, being watched at every turn by security cameras and personnel posted throughout this overgrown portion of the facility. It didn't take long for them to reach their destination. The legendary SCP-006, a small natural spring jutting out of a rock surrounded by rich, emerald grass. It looked more like a nice place to have a picnic than a dangerous and highly secretive anomaly, but McGrath wasn't paid to question things. 
only to carry out Procedure 006. The only object they had with them was the quad sealant container, an ultra-secure liquid containment unit specifically designed for safely transporting samples of SCP-006's water between sites. The team members descended into the spring and began filling up the container. It was nerve-wracking, knowing the stakes of their mission, and knowing that they were submerged in such a deadly substance, but they had a job to do, and they were going to do it come hell or high water. They filled the containment unit, but sadly for McGrath and his team, the mission wouldn't be entirely without casualty. A single bubble rose from the leg of Stewart's suit. He was a good MTF operative, but the youngest and least experienced member of the team. His suit must have somehow been damaged during transit, and now he was compromised. He shared a haunting glance with McGrath and his fellow team members knowing that his part of the mission and his life was about to come to a swift and violent end. Alarms rang out across the facility. A huge team of armed operatives all wearing Class 6 BNC suits charged into the room. Stewart was grabbed and manhandled out of the 006 spring, while his fellow team members sealed the containment unit and continued their mission. There was no time to stop, rest, or mourn. Completing the mission was the absolute priority. If McGrath understood the protocol as well as he thought he did, Stewart would be dragged into a secure room by the site staff and locked in with a blast door. He would look down and notice the floor below him was a metal grate caked with ash. His last thoughts as the incinerator launches its flames into action would strangely be the fact that he was feeling the healthiest he'd been in years. But that wouldn't stop the sudden furnace around him from decimating his body and leaving little more than ash and charred bones. Over a decade of loyal MTF service ended in an instant. Stewart would have been terminated. According to orders from the top, it was all that could be done for those afflicted by SCP-006. A mercy, really, if they were to be believed. McGrath and his team soldiered on. After retrieving the sample, they were hurried back into their inception point one of the many classified bases occupied by the O5 Council members. While DiMaggio and Bennett were ushered off to be given amnestic treatment, McGrath would personally get to see the containment unit and its precious cargo make the final leg of the journey. He was going to be granted access to O5-2, the person this had all been in service of. Commander McGrath approached the secure quarters of the council member, escorted by a bevy of heavily armed security personnel. The doors open and he saw her there. 05-2, bedridden laying at the center of a grand web of life-saving technology. She was beyond old and decrepit. Commander McGrath could see the centuries she'd endured written deeply in the wrinkles and scars of her ancient face. She didn't look like one of the most powerful people in the world. She looked like one of the most feeble. Her eyes lit up when McGrath entered the room holding the containment unit. She beckoned him closer until he was close enough for her to take the containment unit from him with scarred, trembling hands. McGrath watched in horror as she disengaged the lid and swigged down the entirety of its contents. But wasn't the water toxic? He thought. McGrath had been fed the same lie as everybody else. The Foundation didn't keep 006 such a well-guarded secret because it was capable of bringing death. Quite the opposite, in fact. All Commander McGrath could do was stare awestruck as the years seemed to fall from 05-2's face. Decades and decades and decades. Scars faded. Wrinkles disappeared. Little by little, 05-2 began to sit and then stand. By the time she was straightening her clothes, she looked like a healthy woman in her mid-40s. It was a complete and total transformation. The liquid of SCP-006 has a plethora of benefits to human subjects. The ability to regenerate damaged DNA by heightened excitement of cellular duplication and producing a frightening increase in the effectiveness of the human immune system. Even upon testing the liquid on animal subjects, hostile bacteria and viral agents were destroyed immediately. Members of the O5 Council are experts at cheating death, and SCP-006 is just another ace hidden up their sleeve in the endless battle against the Reaper. A secret so well guarded that they're willing to terminate even their most loyal servants to keep it safe. After all, if everyone knew about it, everyone would want it. And the O5 Council are very invested in exclusivity. Never normally one to rise above his station, Commander McGrath couldn't help blurt out, But if it was all a lie, Private Stewart is perfectly alive. 
All smoke and mirrors, you see. And like everyone who works a 006 mission, he won't remember a thing. Good work, Commander McGrath. O5-2, now in perfect health, replied. Now return to your post after a visit to our boys in Amnestics. There's still plenty to be done and we can't afford to dilly-dally. After all, you're not getting any younger. Forty years ago, a U.S. Navy exploratory vessel landed on a chain of islands in the South Atlantic, just 2,000 miles off the coast of Argentina. In other words, the middle of nowhere. Yet on this far-off set of rocks afloat in the middle of the ocean, they discovered a vast array of strange wildlife and plant species that resemble little of what they left behind on the mainland. Could this be a treasure trove of undiscovered species, they wondered. Hoping to capitalize on the discovery, a reconnaissance team of researchers was sent out to explore some of the islands on foot, and what they found did not disappoint. From endangered species of birds, to plant life and vegetation that looked like it belonged on Mars, they found a dizzying array of new and exciting examples of evolutionary oddities that would fill a library. But unfortunately, their jubilation was cut short. Attempting to collect soil samples, they dug into the ground and soon discovered that what they were standing on wasn't actually ground at all. The Navy scientists soon discovered the rocky terrain they were exploring was actually made up entirely of organic matter. As per the standard protocol, the SCP Foundation was forced to silence the U.S. Navy research vessel after its discovery. With the okay from the U.S. government, the ship was torpedoed and sunk to the bottom of the ocean with all hands on deck in the name of protecting the greater good of the masses. A tragedy at sea for the sake of preventing worldwide pandemonium. From there, the Foundation took over with the containment procedures of what would eventually come to be known as SCP-169, better known by its nickname, the Leviathan. The Leviathan is a biblical creature of mythical proportions, said to be able to boil the seas and create earth-ending floods with just a whip of its massive continent-spanning body. It is unclear if SCP-169 has the ability to do these things, though, given its massive size which Foundation researchers estimate to be somewhere between 2,000 and 8,000 kilometers. It's easy to see how something that big moving at any speed could be devastating for the coastal regions of the world. Although we use the word contain, it is impossible for SCP staff to ever contain something of such massive size. Surveillance and monitoring are about all we can do for now. That and hope it never wakes up decides that we're on the menu. It was thought to be relatively smooth sailing, until one incident changed everything. Dr. Hart turned off the video monitor and faced the assembled members of MTF Gamma 6, also known as the Deep Feeders, renowned for their specialization in the tracking of deep sea and oceanic anomalies. The room was dark, and each team member was sitting in shadow, but still Dr. Hart could see the seriousness on their faces. I'm sure you're wondering why I called you here at such short notice, he said. On the screen behind him, he put up a NASA satellite picture of a small set of rocky islands. You see this little island chain here? Well, it wasn't there a week ago. He paused, rubbing his forehead from lack of sleep. At 8.05 a.m. today, we recorded another auditory anomaly emitting from SCP-169. This one was much louder and longer than the one recorded in 1997 by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the one known as the Bloop. Back then, it was easy to brush off as some ice breaking off of a continental shelf and scraping against the seafloor. It's not so easy to cover up anymore. These auditory emissions from SCP-169 are beginning to grow more frequent. More than that, Increased seismic activity around the archipelago on the creature's back indicates that the rate at which the creature is breathing is also up. Typically, the rate at which the creature takes what we are assuming to be a breath is once every three months. The rate has increased to once every three weeks. For as long as we've been monitoring SCP-169, it's been adrift along the southern Atlantic, never moving more than a kilometer a week. That behavior is slowly beginning to change. It doesn't sound like much, but something that big even moving just a fraction of that faster means 100-foot tidal waves for the entire South American coastline. We fear the creature is showing signs of waking up. If this is true, it could mean a cataclysm for the hundreds of nations around the world. Millions, hell, even billions could be wiped off the face of the Earth if this thing just flips its body too fast in the wrong direction. To put it to scale, 
This monster is about the size of the Caribbean. Maybe even bigger, as far as we know. The doctor then pulled out a decanter of whiskey and poured himself a glass, swallowing the entire pour in one go. In an appalling breach of workplace professionalism. Seriously, an XK class end of the world scenario is still no excuse for drinking on the job. We're talking about an extinction level event. A bona fide XK class end of the world scenario. 1,000 foot tsunami waves stretching as far as the eye can see from either end of the horizon. The last time SCP-169 stirred, it created the Mediterranean. In fact, the legends of the biblical flood, Noah's Ark, the same story can be found in every civilization and culture around the world. So maybe they were onto something. It is to this end I call you all here, to save the world from the next great flood. He paused for a moment as the room took in the gravity of the situation. The more we can learn about SCP-169, the better. And right now, we know SWAT. For one, we've never seen just how deep the body of the creature goes, or what's under it. The pressure has been too great for our current model submarines, until now. After reinforcing our Nemo-1 deep-sea submersible with thaumaturgical runes, the integrity of its hull has increased exponentially. Your mission will be to travel as far down and as close to the creature as possible. If it breathes, then there must be gills or lungs. There must be some basic biological facts we need to understand if we're going to survive extinction. Our only recourse is to find a way to sedate the creature. And if that doesn't work, then... God help us all. Just 12 hours later, deep in the waters of the Southern Atlantic, a massive submersible ship was diving down into the depths of the deep ocean, looking for a way to stop the end of the world. Agent Jia 6 1, a member of Deep Feeders, looked out of the massive viewing port as the ship slowly descended alongside the rocky trench that made up the body of SCP 169. Behind him was Dr. Hart, sporting a white 5 o'clock shadow and a red nose from a night of drinking to calm his nerves. The entire crew were silent in awe as the giant floodlights of the ship brushed over the barnacle-covered surfaces of the undersea mountain. They progressed slowly, reaching each milestone in depth with caution, knowing that one wrong move could destabilize the pressure in their ship. Just 6 one murmured the word, Scales. What? asked Dr. Hart. I've been watching the patterns of the ridges as we sink down. They look like scales giant segments. It's hard to see at first because they're so covered in barnacles and sediment, but I'm sure of it. They're giant, armored scales, the way lobsters or crabs have armored exoskeletons. Interesting, the doctor said, scratching his chin. Arthropods have segmented armored bodies, and this means we might be looking at some sort of evolutionary hybrid, some sort of aquatic mammal such as a whale or dolphin, but one that has developed armored segment and scales similar to that of a crustacean. The doctor crossed his arms to think. The closest thing we have on the fossil record of this magnitude is an armored fish from the Cretaceous period, but even that's way too small to compare to this. This thing has an entire ecosystem on its back. How old is it? asked the agent. Well, now that you mention it, given the impossible age of the creature, an arthropod would make sense. Lobsters and other crustaceans don't age conventionally, you see. They are effectively immortal. In fact, they actually die because they continue to grow until their bodies can't hold up their humongous size anymore. And yet, SCP-169 just kept growing. The doctor trailed off, thinking to himself. Dr. Hart, still lost in thought, turned to walk to the back of the submersible as Jia 6-1 followed. He said as much to himself as to the agent, The creature is old. The geological survey conducted when SCP-169 was first discovered carbon dated the specimen to over 541 million years old. As you can probably surmise, that's too old for any living being. The results had to be incorrect, and yet I checked them myself more than once. The numbers do not lie. The entity predates our civilization. Hell, it predates complex life forms on this planet as we know it. From an evolutionary standpoint, it doesn't make any sense. The agent, confused, asked, Doctor, how could something so big even come into existence? Very little of our planet is actually landmass. It's a wonder we call it Earth. Most of this planet is water. We aren't looking at a creature that's on our planet, agent. We are on its planet. Just then a flurry of alarms and sensors began to go off at the bridge of the ship. 
The team scrambled through their stations, checking off monitors and shouting readings to each other. The ship's thermal sensors are detecting a massive rise in temperature, transmitting power to cooling systems. We have activity northwest of our location. Sonar has something big headed our way. We need to dive now! The ship lurched forward, nose first, as everyone on board held onto their seats, the restraints keeping them from falling forward. Just outside of the viewing port, Dr. Hart could see an enormous scaled appendage moving fast in their location. We need to steer the ship clear of the talons! Revert all power to the thrusters, get us out of the way! The doctor yelled. Don't you think I'm doing that? The captain shouted back. The ship jolted sideways and downwards as an immense wave of pressure came over the submersible, putting six Gs of force on its occupants. Zhe 6-1 yelped out of fear as the ship came close to crashing into what appeared to be the edge of a titanic talon the size of the Empire State Building. Following the encounter, the part of the ship bordering the reinforced glass of the viewing port began to glow bright red. It's boiling the water around us! One of the crew members cried out. It's not boiling anything, it's just cavitation due to the pressure reduction in the water. The updated runes on the ship's hull should keep us safe, we just need to cool our heads. Stay focused on the mission bottom feeders. After several moments of holding their breaths, the crew of Nemo 1 began to relax as their pace returned to a slow descent along the side of the underwater behemoth. Before long, the vessel was no longer traveling straight down, but starting to curve under the creature, traveling north towards the theoretical head of SCP-169. After several hours, the ship came upon giant fissures in the rocky exterior of the creature. These massive vent-like structures appeared stiff, but slowly they opened and closed over the span of weeks. These were the respiratory organs of the organism. Clocking in at over two miles underneath the surface of the ocean, the crew carefully began entering the smaller pod-like submersibles that detached from the main ship. Zhe 6-1 entered his pod and strapped on the haptic gloves that would give him control of the pod's robotic arms. He and a team of three other volunteers had agreed to undergo the dangerous mission of attaching artificial chemical emission machines that could be programmed to release anesthetic gas into SCP-169's respiratory system on command remotely. The emission machines could be refueled manually whenever the contents ran out. It was an ingenious solution Dr. Hart came up with when thinking of his time studying sharks as a marine biologist. They would tag the fins of sharks by capturing them and bringing the specimens on the deck of their boat. From there, the scientist would drill a radio frequency emitter onto the fin of the shark. When he had first seen this practice as a young college student, Dr. Hart was afraid the process was harming the shark, but later he learned it was designed in a way to not be harmful to the specimen, and eventually the tag would fall off after enough data on the shark's movement was collected. Except these tags would not be falling off, he thought. They could not. For the sake of all mankind, this had to work. The doctor pressed a button on the receiver of the radio and spoke. Zhe 6-1, what's your status? Pressure's holding, all signs look good. Zhe 6-2? Pressure's holding, all good. Zhe 6-3, all clear, Captain. Zhe 6-4, there was silence. Zhe 6-4, do you copy? <clears throat> all clear, Doc, sorry, my mic was muted. On route and ready to do this thing. Dr. Hart sighed in relief and slowly reclined in his chair, watching the pods move closer to the large openings on SCP-169's side. One by one, the robotic arms used underwater torches to drill into the thick, rock-like exoskeleton of the creature, screwing in complex million-dollar equipment that was both waterproof and could withstand the immense pressure at such a depth under the ocean. As the minutes turned to hours, Dr. Hart couldn't help but feel anxiety for the safety of his crew and the success of the mission. But before long, the pods began to return one by one to the mothercraft, each completing the segment of work with which they were tasked. The last pod still working was Zhe 6-1, whose robotic arm was in the process of rotating a large industrial-sized screw. Zhe 6-1 had all but finished when suddenly a low rumble could be felt shaking the larger submersible. Dr. Hart's voice came crackling over the radio. Get back to the ship now! Zhe 6-1, wrapped in deep focus on his task, replied, I'm just about finished, just packing up my tool belt. Leave it. Return to the ship now. That's an order. Jesus, what's wrong? It's not like this is the end of the world, said the agent, chuckling over his radio. An ear-piercing echo sent shockwaves through the depths of the ocean around the submersible. The waves rumbled with the sound of SCP-169's voice, similar to the sound of a large whale, 
but amplified by a million. The sound sent all the crew members falling to the floor as the ship experienced severe damage from the burst of pressure, slightly cracking the glass viewport and sending smoke flooding into the small bridge of the ship. Gas masks! shouted Dr. Hart as they all donned breathing apparatus. SCP-169 is waking up. Begin activation of the chemical emission machines. We need to sedate it now. The Leviathan is waking up. We need to stop it, shouted Dr. Hart. Just then, he looked back and noticed Je-6-1's pod was gone. Je-6-1, what's your position? Je-6-1, where are you? Sir, Sona has him drifting off deeper into the ocean behind us. He must have gotten knocked off SCP-169 by the shockwave. But Dr. Hart wouldn't have it. He didn't want any more blood on his hands. Reverse thrusters, turn us around and get to him. We're not losing anyone. But the breach in the hull! It'll hold, that's what the runes are for. The outside of the submersible began to glow a slight blue as the ship system started to come back online to full capacity and alarm systems started to turn off and report normal pressure readings. Before long, the Nemo-1 had caught up to Je-6-1's pod and retrieved the agent, who had been knocked unconscious by the shockwave. Once the agent was back on the main ship, the doctor turned his attention back to the monitors, making sure the installations they drilled into the creature were functional. Slowly, the machines came online to full power, and the speed at which SCP-169 had been moving began to slow ever so slightly. The team all watched the viewport in silence as a steady stream of anesthetic gas was pumped into the respiratory system of the gigantic living myth in front of them. After a few moments of waiting, the doctor spoke. I think it worked, he said with a smile. The crew erupted in cheers as they radioed control back up on land that the mission had been a success. The message quickly reached the O5 Council, where a red alert status was de-escalated, and the O5 members withdrew from their plan of leaving the current Earth for that of an alternate universe. The whole crew began to sing and celebrate the prevention of the end of the world, as Dr. Hart simply stood in front of the massive viewport, watching the mountainous specimen slowly grow smaller in the distance as the submersible began ascending back to the world above. Je-6-1 came over to congratulate him, patting him on the back. We did it! He said, loosen up. The doctor managed to laugh along in acknowledgement. <laughs> that we did, he said in relief. That we did. The two watched the deep blue ocean in silence, taking in the vastness of the sea. Perhaps this would not be the end of it, but that day, they had done what the SCP Foundation did best, kick that apocalyptic can a few miles down the road. And sometimes, in the face of the terrifying and the infinite, that's really the best you can do. You're right in the middle of one of the hottest summers on record. The days are filled with bright, scorching sun and searing heat, and you've been laying around with your air conditioning on full blast just to try and cool yourself off. Sadly, it's not really working, and the heat is becoming way too much. But then you remember there's this married couple that lives near you, with no kids, and they happen to have a swimming pool in their yard. Normally they keep to themselves, they'd never let you use their pool, but they've gone out of town for a few days. Besides, the heat is killing you. You're sure that the neighbors wouldn't mind if you just took a quick dip, as long as you clean up after yourself. They probably wouldn't even notice you were even there. Cautiously, you make your way to their house. It's an unremarkable place similar to most of the other houses in this suburb of New Mexico. After checking that there's nobody else around, you climb the two meter high cinder block wall that stands around the back garden. As you drop to your feet, sweaty and panting from the unrelenting summer heat, you see it. The pool, your salvation. Water never looks so appealing. Immediately, you step barefoot across the sun-scorched tiles and sit on the edge, legs in the water. It's cool and refreshing, perfect for a day as hot as today. You're already changed and wearing your swim trunks, so it doesn't take long for you to paddle out to the middle of the pool, letting that chilled, clean water cool you off. As you're taking a dip, you notice the pool's jets turning on automatically. It's a little bit odd, but you shrug it off. That couple clearly shelled out for a pool with a lot of fancy bells and whistles. But extra features aren't why you're here. You came because if you didn't, then you could have melted under all that sunlight. Floating on the surface of the water, you relax with your arms behind your head and close your eyes. You don't have time to realize that coming here was a mistake. Instead, you start to feel relaxed. So calm. So tranquil. You're one with the water around you now. 
It's almost as though you could just disappear. So, you do. The police never find any trace of you. Everyone else simply writes it off as a random disappearance. There's not even so much as a scrap of your body left in the pool. Just the clear, clean water. Why? Because the swimming pool you decided to take a cooling dip in wasn't an ordinary pool. It was SCP-242. But don't worry, you won't be the last to make that costly mistake. What you didn't know is that the married couple who live in that house are secretly a pair of SCP Foundation doctors. The house isn't even theirs. The Foundation procured it after the former owner, a retired out-of-state landlord, strangely vanished. He had been struggling to find anyone to rent the place, so he eventually decided to give up on the property game and move in there himself. After three days, he was never seen again. Now that house has only one rule that must be followed above all else. Do not swim in the pool. SCP-242 is, at least to the untrained eye, just an average swimming pool. A decent 9 meters in length, 4.5 wide, and it holds around 53,000 liters of sterile pool water. Like we mentioned before, it's even got some nifty features like water jets, a dual waterfall, and a built-in vacuum unit for sucking out any impurities. And we mean any impurities. You see, SCP-242 does go by another name, the self-cleaning pool. And while that might not sound as foreboding or dramatic as the Scarlet King or the Wendigo Skull or the horrifying nasty dude of ultimate badness, okay, we made that last one up, we can assure you that you don't ever want to suffer the fate of taking a swim in this pool. There was an incident a while ago, recorded by the Foundation through a secret hidden camera. The house where SCP-242 can be found had been left vacant for a time, and once again some opportunists decided to take advantage of the empty swimming pool. This time it was a couple, a man and a woman in their early 20s. They climbed up the back wall, undressed, and even stole a couple of plastic inflatable rafts from a shed in the house's backyard. The water jets switched themselves on, startling the girl, but her boyfriend told her not to worry. The filter to clean the pool was probably just on an automatic timer, right? Surely it wouldn't have been anything to worry about. After swimming together for around 24 minutes, the couple both agreed that the water felt warm, tingly even. Both of them climbed onto their rafts, eventually falling asleep while still holding each other's hands. But almost half an hour after the jets had started, something caused the two rafts to burst. The couple awoke, startled by the loud pop of the splitting inflatables and being plunged back into the water. The pool around them immediately began frothing violently, deep red streams of blood swirling through the water as the couple screamed in fear and agony. Both of them tried to desperately swim to the edge, hoping to leave the pool and get to safety. But unfortunately, that plan didn't work. Before they could reach the edge, the man and the woman were pulled under the surface of the raging water, their limbs thrashing as they still tried in vain to escape. Eventually, they vanished under the crimson, bloody water. The frothing slowly began to calm, and the red in the pool dissipated, once again becoming clear after 48 seconds. The couple were never seen again, and a cover story was leaked to the press by the SCP Foundation two weeks after they went missing. According to them, the pair had eloped together somewhere in Mexico. If only. That sounds a lot nicer than what actually happened to them. So this swimming pool clearly has some anomalous properties, that much is obvious. But what exactly are those properties? How exactly does SCP-242 work? Is it an interdimensional gateway that drags people to a nasty alternate universe if they spend too long swimming in it? Or is the swimming pool itself a sentient, carnivorous creature that lures humans in only to devour them? Maybe the water is teeming with invisible flesh-eating piranhas that can strip the meat from the bone in a matter of seconds. Well, good guesses all around, but actually, it's none of these. It's unclear what causes the pool's anomalous effects. It could be a property that is completely unique to the water contained in SCP-242. Or maybe it's down to the exact shape and measurements of the pool itself. It could even be a combination of both. But whatever the cause, the result is always the same. When any object, substance, or even living organism is placed in SCP-242, it will be entirely rewritten on a molecular level. The genetic anatomic structure will fall apart, 
and the subject will be transmuted into sterile water. In fact, not just clean water, but water that remains sterile even when removed from the pool. If you took a cup of SCP-242's water and mixed something like food coloring into it, the food coloring would not be absorbed into the water, instead staying as one non-missable bubble. This process doesn't happen instantly, though. It can vary depending on how contaminated or complex the substance placed in SCP-242 is. For example, water sampled from a nearby river was sterilized and purified by the pool in about seven minutes. A sample of stagnant pond water riddled with various diseases and germs took 11 minutes longer. What about 50,000 liters of coal tar? Well, that one took a little longer. 12 long days, to be exact. But was still turned into pure sterile water. And as for a living human being? Maybe ask that couple that took a dip in the self-cleaning pool. The Foundation is naturally fascinated with the pool, and after extensive examination, they have determined that SCP-242 doesn't seem to have been intentionally designed for the specific anomalous function it performs. The components of SCP-242 beyond the pool itself, the filter, the vacuum, the pipes, none of these parts nor anything about the swimming pool's design appear to be responsible for disintegrating matter until only water remains. You might have noticed that in the case of the ill-fated couple who took a swim in SCP-242, the water jets and waterfall features switched themselves on automatically before the pair's grim demise. Somehow these features are able to activate without the need for electricity, as disconnecting the pool from a power source will not stop the jets and waterfall from coming on once a non-water substance is placed into SCP-242. The same goes for the pool vacuum, which apparently cannot be jammed or malfunction, even when the bottom of the pool is awash with viscous liquids like that coal tar. The vacuum will continue to operate as normal, scrubbing away at the floor of SCP-242. The one part of the self-cleaning pool that doesn't work as you would expect is the water filtration system. There is never any water being cycled into the pool nor out of it. As a matter of fact, the pipes connecting to the filtration system have all been removed. Then again, who needs a filtration system when your backyard swimming pool can just spontaneously reduce anything to clean water? But that raises another frightening thought. Everything that the pool has ever taken and converted is still in there. Animals, objects, people, just swimming around you. Perhaps if they could still think, they'd scream and shout and tell you to get away to run while you still can. But the second your skin touches the water, you're destined to be with them forever and ever and ever. It's enough to send a liquid chill down your spine. Okay, so if it's not the actual physical pool that causes these anomalous effects, that must mean it's something in the water, right? Perhaps some microscopic flesh-devouring microbe, or some ancient curse that was placed on the water before it was used to fill up the pool. Surely, if you took a cup of water out of SCP-242, it would still break down structures on a molecular level, leaving only more sterile water. Well, the researchers working at the SCP Foundation thought much of the same and conducted a series of tests to determine the exact properties of SCP-242's water. One test involved submerging two D-Class test subjects, each wearing an atmospheric dive suit, into SCP-242. The goal was to determine if it was safe to consume the water from SCP-242 while both inside and outside of the pool. Test Subject A was lowered into the water and instructed to drink from a metal straw by their mouth. The eyepieces of their goggles were blacked out, so they couldn't see what they were drinking from. Subject B filled a barrel with the same water from SCP-242 and then was made to put on an atmospheric dive suit, but instructed to stay out of the pool. Test Subject A was told to drink directly from the pool, remarking that the water was warm and had a bit of a noticeable chemical aftertaste, but was otherwise normal. Then Test Subject B drank some of the same water from the barrel. Apparently, it was cool and tasted of… well, nothing, just like water usually does. After a moment more of drink, Subject A began belching, finding that they had uncontrollable gas. The water had begun to feel warmer stinging the subject's mouth while, for Subject B, the water from the barrel stayed cool and refreshing. The Foundation doctors overseeing the experiment instructed Test Subject A to keep drinking, which they did until it felt even hotter to the taste. 
one of the D-Class's fillings even fell out, and eventually the structural integrity of Subject A's dive suit failed, presumably disintegrated by the water from SCP-242. After a few muffled screams and gurgling noises, Test Subject A wasn't heard from again, and we can all probably guess why. As for Subject B, they kept drinking from the barrel, suffering no adverse effects, even after 17 long hours. There were no noticeable psychological or physical changes, even their urine showed no traces of abnormality. The water from SCP-242 left in the barrel evaporated as normal, leaving behind no residue or any indicator as to why taking the water out of the pool made it safer to drink than the same water in the pool. Perhaps the moral of the story is to just be careful where you choose to take a swim. Otherwise, it could be your last. You're on a road trip, the kind that stretches over days on end, and you need to make multiple stops along the way to refuel the car and yourself. The last time you remember stopping to get more gas and a bite to eat was back in Wyoming, and now you're in the heart of Montana. Thankfully, like an oasis in the desert, you see the town of Clearwater off in the distance. It's a vibrant, welcoming little place, a perfect slice of classic small-town Americana. You took a similar trip last year, and vaguely remember stopping at Clearwater that time too, and you're glad to be back. In particular, you remember the Old Prairie Diner, a folksy little place with the most delicious huckleberry pie you ever tasted. Perhaps it's about time for you to give it another try. You fill up your tank and stop at the diner. The food tastes just as good as you remember, but one thing is off. The entire staff seems to have changed. It is the exact same diner you ate at a year ago, no doubt about that. But it looks like everyone from the wait staff to the cashier to the cooks have all been replaced. You try your best not to think about it. After all, businesses are allowed to replace their staff. But the longer you sit in the diner, the more uncomfortable the feelings become. You need to ask someone, just to push away the fears that you're not going crazy. When the waiter passes by, you compliment the food and mention you ate here last year too. You ask the unfamiliar waiter if they had worked here back then. They confirm that yes, they've always worked here, and so has everybody else. The diner is a family business. You leave town not too long after that, feeling vaguely unsettled. And as a voice on the radio warns about the incoming rain, you tell yourself that you never want to return to the town of Clearwater, Montana. As you leave, the memory of the town seems to fade from your mind in real time. But little do you know, the people of Clearwater will never be able to leave. Ever. It's because something horrifying will happen in Clearwater every single year. And that thing is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-3300. This annual anomalous event is Clearwater's own local curse, always occurring around mid-June. While many of the mechanics of this event still elude the Foundation's understanding, the outcome is well documented. Every single inhabitant of the town is replaced by a person who didn't previously exist. While some elements may carry over from their original counterparts, every person involved will simply be a whole new person, with no memories of the change or who they once were. The process known as SCP-3300 lasts between 6 and 18 days, and once the process has begun, it's impossible for any outsiders to intervene. It begins with rain, a light, dreary drizzle at first, but each day the rain gets worse. Soon it's a storm, and then a maelstrom. Flooding, hurricanes, tornadoes, all centered around Clearwater but cutting off neatly just beyond it. What happens in Clearwater remains in Clearwater, and when the process has concluded and the sun shines once more, everybody has been changed. Whenever the Foundation has tried to send personnel or equipment into Clearwater during SCP-3300, one of two things has happened. In the more favorable scenarios, those attempting to enter Clearwater have simply appeared on the other side of the city limits. In the less positive instances, personnel and equipment have been lost forever within. There is no stopping or even understanding SCP-3300. According to Foundation records, Clearwater has been around at least as long as the Foundation itself, perhaps even longer. Clearwater has been able to undergo its yearly nightmare without intrusion due to a unique cognitohazardous effect, which creates a kind of mental block around memories of the town for outsiders. You won't forget Clearwater, per se, but you will find it increasingly hard to focus on 
like something you can only ever see out of the corner of your eye. There is no saving the people of Clearwater. The horror will play out again and again and again. The Foundation has no first-hand knowledge of what happens in Clearwater during those horrifying 18 days, but one account they have hints at a terrifying possibility. During an excursion into Clearwater, the Foundation managed to collect a diary belonging to a woman named Margaret Lane. To the best of our knowledge, Margaret Lane no longer exists. But if the contents of her diary aren't to be believed, then what goes on in Clearwater during SCP-3300 is far worse than we ever imagined. Margaret first started her diary not long before SCP-3300's 1995 iteration began. She was in the middle of a tumultuous time in her life. Freshly clean from alcohol and drug addiction, forced to live with her antagonistic mother, and having peculiar and distressing dreams. In the first dream Margaret recorded, she was someone else. A woman living in a small hut perhaps a century ago or more. It was plague time. She was looking down upon her daughter, bedridden, her skin covered in painful looking red blotches. Her husband was already dead. That's when another man enters, a healthy man. He tells her that he's found their salvation, and then the dream ended. Margaret woke up to a gray, dreary day. There were clouds on the horizon. The rain was coming. It drizzled for the next few days before getting more intense, as one would expect from an SCP-3300 cycle. Of course, nothing seemed out of place to Margaret. Life carried on. She continued to stay clean, resisting the offers of her old dealer, though her relationship with her mother remained frosty. The rain started to get worse as voices on the radio insisted that conditions would continue to become more severe over the next few days. They tried their best to maintain normality. Margaret invited some friends, Jared, Sam, Mike, and Isabel to come over and play D&D at her place. That was when all hell broke loose. While the group roleplayed, there was a furious banging at the door, like whoever was knocking was trying to bash the door down. When Margaret's mom opened the door to investigate the commotion, she saw that an entire family was standing there, a father, a mother, and two young children. The father immediately began furiously asking why all these strangers were in his house. When Margaret's mother tried to tell him that this wasn't his house, he became increasingly agitated and walked straight into the home. Margaret's friends attempted to subdue him, but he threw them off, displaying a supernatural strength. Margaret's mom ran in with a golf club and struck the mysterious man in the chest. There was a nasty splat, but he didn't seem to react. The golf club was just embedded in his chest, having broken the skin and sunken in. But there was no blood, just dripping water. The father then pulled the golf club out of his chest and began beating Margaret's mother to death with it, all while repeating my house again and again, while his wife and children watched with broad, sunny smiles in the rain. Somehow Margaret knew that her mother was beyond saving, and that there was no way of defeating these things in a physical confrontation. All they could do was run out to Jared's van with the rest of the group and hightail it to the police station. But when they arrived at the station, the doors were barred and it appeared empty. As the torrential rain hammered down from above, there was nothing left to do but drive out of town and try to escape whatever madness was going on here. But that was easier said than done. They drove for what seemed like hours on end as the rain and the howling wind persisted. Jared had been injured during the fight with the strange family and his health deteriorated further as the drive stretched on. They should have left the town of Clearwater a long time ago, but it seemed like they were nowhere. It wasn't long before Jared was lying dead in the back of the van, and now there were only four of them left. They kept driving, afraid, grieving, hungry, and tired, and Margaret took the opportunity to sleep. It was no time to rest, but she was so exhausted that she had no choice. Margaret had a continuation of her earlier dream. The different her, the dream her, was laying the plague-ridden body of her daughter in the river. But she wasn't the only one. All the villages of her settlement were placing the bodies of their dead in the river as the water washed around them and through them. The bodies became one with the water, and then they became the water. The water was everything. When Margaret awoke, it was to the horrifying sounds of bubbling and boiling. That's when she saw that Jared's body was dissolving. No, not dissolving, evaporating. It was bubbling and convulsing like it was made of water until the entire thing burst into a cascade of hot steam. After that, 
Margaret and the others left the vehicle and refused to get back inside. Nothing was making sense. It was like something out of a nightmare. As they walked, the rain hammered down upon them. They couldn't have been walking for more than a mile when they crashed into something. It was a sign, welcome to Clearwater. It was like that the town itself had drawn them back. Mike refused to return to the town of his own free will and began walking in the other direction. Moments later, he was walking back towards them in silence, though he'd never intended to. SCP-3300 had distorted his path and brought him back. It was clear that Mike was shaken to the core by the experience, but they had to press on. They would head to the grocery store for food, and then to a sporting goods store where they could hopefully grab some guns to fight the violent, altered people who'd somehow appeared with the rain. But things didn't go to plan, or what little plan there even was. Mike shot himself on the first night at Dirk's Sporting Goods, leaving only Margaret, Sam, and Isabel alive. Perhaps one of the most terrifying details of Mike's death was the fact he didn't even bleed. Instead, the gaping exit wound in the back of his head was just full of water. Water was all that seemed to be left of them. Sam, seemingly driven to the edge by the sight of Mike's death, grabbed a hunting knife to perform an experiment. She'd cut it into her own skin, and was horrified to see only water dripping out. They'd all been changed, and they didn't know why. That's when the survivors noticed something else. There were people standing outside in the rain, hundreds of them. Not a single one they could recognize. All new people, waiting. Sam said only one word, outside, before walking out of the hunting goods store and disappearing into the crowd in the rain, never to be seen again. Margaret mused that perhaps in the end, she had the right idea. To be taken, killed, erased, or changed would be inevitable. In the final entry in Margaret's diary, dreams blend with reality as her mind finally gives out from the terror. She realizes in her final moments that there is no way out. There is no escape. There is only water. Water is eternal. The rain is eternal. All will be changed. And given the fact that no trace of Margaret was ever found save for her diary, all her fears turned out to be right. She was taken and replaced by SCP-3300 just as will inevitably happen to all the current citizens of Clearwater the next time SCP-3300 rolls around. It will be as inevitable and as indifferent to those it affects as tomorrow's sunrise. You cannot change the rain, but believe us, in Clearwater, Montana, the rain can change you. The year is 1985, 16th of February. A pair of researchers aboard a Model SM-03 deep sea submersible are descending into the depths of the Atlantic Ocean. Hours ago, they were somewhere just off the coast of France, surrounded by blue sky, the smell of the sea, and the warm embrace of the sun. But now, only cold darkness surrounds them. The depth of the ocean so vast and overwhelming, even light could not escape its grasp. The two-man team are members of MTF Gamma-6, also known as the Deep Feeders, a special task force that specializes in the investigation and tracking of deep sea or oceanic anomalies. Their mission, to locate and investigate the wreckage of a World War II German warship known as the Bismarck, thought by the general public to have gone down in a naval battle with the British in 1941. But the story the public doesn't know is the real reason the pair of Foundation members were tasked with locating the ship's wreckage site. Unfortunately for these researchers, today would be remembered for something far worse than they had anticipated. Radio transmissions recorded by the Gamma 6 duo detailed the events that took place upon finding the Bismarck designated SCP-4217. The Bismarck lay at the bottom of the ocean partially submerged in the sea floor, but to the astonishment of researchers, it appeared to be perfectly intact, with no signs of damage from its previous naval engagements. Gamma 6 member Charles Miller comments, even after the better part of five decades, this ship is still in pristine condition. There is no water damage anywhere that I can see, even stranger, no ocean sediment has accumulated on the hull of the ship whatsoever. Prompted to investigate closer, Agent Victor Miller begins operation of the crew's Model RV-1 Marine Probe, an unmanned robotic exploratory drone that allows the researchers to explore the interior of the ship's wreckage. What they found unnerved them, or better said, what they didn't find. 
Just as the outside of the vessel appeared free of any corrosion or wear, the interior of the ship was just as immaculate. The hallways were clean. The walls adorned freshly painted signs in still legible German. Even the Nazi symbols painted onto command centers still held no sign of disintegration. It was as if the ship had just come off the assembly line. But strangest of all was the lack of skeletal remains. At the time it was sunk, the original crew of the Bismarck boasted a minimum of 2,000 men. Where were the bodies? Continuing the mission, the researchers piloted their unmanned drone down the eerie winding corridors. Along several of the inner corridors of the submerged wreckage of SCP-4217, the crew find large, thick walls of what appear to be made out of a rubber-like substance. Soon they find that the large vein-like growths extend throughout the interior of the ship-like tendrils, growing in size the closer the exploratory drone gets to the center of the vessel. All the while, a slight hum sound is picked up by the craft's sonar equipment, echoing from the center of the ship a rhythmic pulsing. The crew decide they need to take a sample of the rubber-like substance back to Foundation Headquarters for testing. This would be a mistake. Upon cutting into the thick tentacle-like growths, the researchers notice something that fills their stomachs with dread. Whatever substance they had cut into was now bleeding. The team hears a distant rumble growing steadily louder. Suddenly, the ship begins to move. Shuffling sand and debris strew along the seafloor, clouding the visibility of the ship. Terrified, the pair hurried to try and disconnect the cable attaching the probe to their submersible and evacuate the site. But it's too late. A booming thud shakes the underwater craft as a large shadow covers the glass window of the submersible. Alarm systems go off as cracks start to appear in the glass surface. The pair attempt to pilot the vessel up towards the surface, but they are halted by a strong force pulling them downward. Just as the cracks start to spread across the surface of the glass, a giant shadow looms over the submersible. What is that? Screams and the sound of shattering glass can be heard on the recording as the submersible implodes from the pressure of the watery depths. Since that unfortunate incident, Foundation members have recorded multiple occurrences of SCP-4217 attacking civilian cargo ships in the Atlantic, particularly off the coast of the United Kingdom and as far north as the Greenland Sea. Given its Keter containment classification, Containment of SCP-4217 consists of constant monitoring by Foundation naval forces with the cooperation of the British Royal Navy. In episodes of aggression or an agitated or hostile state, naval forces are instructed to forcibly subdue SCP-4217 through naval engagement. Once enough damage is sustained, SCP-4217 enters a passive state and resubmerges. SCP-4217 is divided into two parts. SCP-4217-A is the Bismarck itself, a Nazi-era warship outfitted with an array of eight main guns, 44 secondary armaments, and dozens of units of anti-aircraft weaponry. SCP-4217-B refers to the anomalous cephalopod organism embedded inside the hull of the ship. SCP-4217-B has two large rectangular pupils inside of octopod eyes that protrude from the base of the ship, as well as 12 100 to 200 meter long tendril-like muscular appendages that extend outward from an opening in the stern of the vessel. SCP-4217 is deemed to be classification risk class dangerous with reports of it emitting a mild psionic field within a 20 kilometer radius, confusing anything within range and increasing the likelihood of friendly fire among enemy combatants. SCP-4217-A's hull seems to have the ability of inorganic regeneration, as damage incurred from enemy vessels seems to immaculately repair over time. Researchers have observed what appears to be runes or cryptic markings oh. on the side of SCP-4217-A's hull. It is believed these symbols were part of the original ship's design to bolster the vessel's defense integrity. Though not immediately visible, when the vessel is taking fire, the symbols appear to glow in proportion to the amount of damage being mitigated. Among its offensive capabilities, apart from the standard armaments of a World War II era warship, SCP-4217-A also has specialized munitions of an unidentifiable gas compound that is reported to have mutagenic properties. Individuals that have been exposed to the gas compound undergo rapid, spontaneous metamorphosis at a molecular level, 
growing an array of evolutionary attributes, which include the accumulation of reptile-like scales, or avian feathers, in place of skin, the increase or decrease of the number of limbs, digits, or even ocular, olfactory, or auditory organs, and in one reported case, an event where multiple members of one crew were fused at a subatomic level into one functioning organism. The more study into this particular incident is needed. SCP-4217 also has the ability of subsurface oceanic mobility and can submerge itself when not in combat with enemy vessels. Underwater propulsion appears to be generated by the ejection of water from SCP-4217-B's body cavity and reaches a top speed of approximately 30 knots. SCP-4217 undergoes cycles of passive behavior that is periodically interrupted by moments of hostility towards civilian craft, particularly resurfacing and going after transatlantic cargo vessels. It is believed this is analogous to the history and original mission of the Bismarck, Operation Rheinenbung. During World War II, the German Luftwaffe was besieging London in a series of nightly air raids that would be colloquially known as the Blitz. It was the grand intention of the Third Reich to cut off supplies to the British to limit their resistance to the Nazi war machine. However, what pestered the Nazis most and hindered this effort was the consistent American support provided by the US government in the form of food and supplies delivered to the British via Atlantic trade routes by cargo ship. The German Bismarck and her sister ship, the Tirpitz, were created for the very goal of stopping these transports of cargo to the United Kingdom, as well as sinking as many Allied vessels as possible. The year is 1937. In a top-secret effort to make preparations for an approaching war, Adolf Hitler turns to his most trusted expert on the supernatural, Chief SS Officer Heinrich Himmler. Among other projects, Himmler ordered the Anerbe Obscura Corps, a German organization tasked with the procurement and investigation of otherworldly or otherwise unexplainable phenomenon, to begin the creation of two ships, the Bismarck and the Tirpitz, the former named after the Iron Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, who in 1890 unified the German people. These vessels were to be created using recently uncovered technological oddities the Obscura Corps had found in their studies of the occult. Sources of information about the exact creation of SCP-4217 are highly expunged from the record, but bits and pieces did survive, among what little the Foundation was able to collect and in the records of the USSR after their occupation of Eastern Germany, following the fall of the Nazi regime during the Second World War. The earliest mention of SCP-4217's conception dates back to early 1937, when a top-secret shipment of unknown materials labeled Components of Thaumatological Constructs is intercepted by a Foundation agent working undercover in a German shipment center outside of Hamburg. The Foundation agent, Marcus Straub, is instructed to maintain surveillance on the shipment. In 1939, upon near completion of the soon-to-be-christened Bismarck, a second shipment labeled with the insignia of the Obscura Corps is intercepted by the Foundation agent, only this shipment appears unlike any other. Reports of the massive shipping container holding machinery capable of aquatic life support indicate organic living cargo. Though the Foundation agent was unable to identify the exact nature of the contents of the shipment, Straub reported hearing sounds emanating from the cargo hold, sounds similar to that of a heartbeat. Just a year later, the Bismarck is seen making its first naval trial run when it experiences a massive electrical discharge just offshore, shutting the vessel down momentarily until power was restored shortly after. Reports show luminescent symbols briefly visible on the hull of the ship. Thaumatological symbols, for the layman, are symbols that embody the study of miracles. Because of this, it was apparent to the Foundation that some occult anomaly was responsible for the strange characteristics of the German vessel and an order for termination was reached by the O5 Council, the hunt for SCP-4217. In the autumn of 1940, under orders of neutralization of SCP-4217, all active Foundation agents presiding in Germany were ordered to converge on the site of the Bismarck to stop the completion of the vessel. But when the time came for the operation, every single one of the Foundation agents vanished. No records of what happened were ever found, no clothing, notes, not even a trace of their existence was left behind. The mission was deemed a failure, and subsequent attempts to neutralize SCP-4217 became far more difficult after the Bismarck received a full crew of seamen. The fully manned and well-equipped SCP-4217 became a menace to both military and civilian craft on the high seas of the Atlantic. 
at times appearing without warning, seemingly out of thin air. SCP-4217 psionic field obscured it from the new technological advancements in enemy radar systems the U.S. government had in development. The ship became a shadow on the Atlantic, a subject of ghost stories for anyone daring to assist the British government with the war effort. Furthermore, SCP-4217 did not seem to be content with the surrender of enemy vessels. Captured enemy ships were gassed, turning the men into manufactured beasts and then sinking the enemy vessels to the depths of the ocean. Even submarines were no match, on one report describing an attempt to elude the vessel by diving below the surface, only to be entangled by enormous squid-like appendages that dragged the craft back up to the surface before crushing it in its grasp. Fearing the safety of the public, the O5 Council decided they could not stand by and let more innocent lives be taken. They voted to supersede the Foundation's policy on absolute secrecy to notify the British government of the danger SCP-4217 posed to maritime civilians. With cooperation from the British Royal Navy, Foundation representatives joined the crew of HMS Hood and HMS Prince of Wales to track reports of the Bismarck being sighted off the coast of Scandinavia. In what history books would come to know as the Battle of Denmark Strait, HMS Hood and HMS Prince of Wales engaged SCP-4217 and a secondary German warship known as the Prinz Jürgen. Confused by the ship's psionic field, the British naval ships experienced trouble identifying the Bismarck and engage in friendly fire before being able to regain control of their armaments, concentrating all volley of fire on SCP-4217. The attack proves futile, as after the embers and smoke of munitions fire wear off, the sides of the Bismarck's hull appear to vibrate with glowing energy. Mangled metal begins to straighten back into perfect frame, breaches in armor begin to heal before the soldiers' very eyes. And all that is left as evidence the ship had ever taken fire is a cloud of steam emanating from the hull of SCP-4217. The water surrounding the vessel begin to boil as underwater tentacles lurch out and capture the HMS Hood, dragging Her Majesty's ship forward. The men aboard frantically try to regain control, but seconds later are met with another crisis. A salvo of artillery shells fired from SCP-4217's guns hit the ship, severing lines and damaging railguns, as a mutagenic gas compound starts to spread among the royal seamen. In mere minutes, the majority of the crew are engulfed in toxic fumes and experience vomiting and convulsions, their bodies undergoing rapid involuntary mutagenesis, including the growth of limbs, the development of fur, feathers, and scales. In one report, it was said that multiple victims even fused together to create one single horrifying entity. Those exposed to the gaseous compound were designated SCP-4217-1. The captain of the HMS Hood barricades himself inside the helm, but the resulting instances of SCP-4217-1 overpower the ship and neutralize command. In the seconds that follow, any witness of the horror that the men aboard the HMS Hood experienced is forever entombed in the watery grave of the British vessel, as the ship is sunk by a volley of munitions fire from the combined might of the German fleet. Some men attempting to jump overboard and swim to safety are dragged down by their legs by the mutated instances of SCP-4217 and pulled under, lungs filling with seawater, as they scream until their breath is no more. In disbelief, the crew of HMS Prince of Wales decides to retreat. In the days that followed, at the bequest of Foundation members, the British Royal Navy launches a full-scale armada to hunt down and neutralize the Bismarck. Though SCP-4217 sustained little damage in the previous encounter, the ship began leaking a black, oil-like substance thought by SCP researchers to be an organic waste product of SCP-4217-B. The Allied naval forces are able to follow the trail to the coast of France, where under the lead of HMS King George V, British warships surround the German vessel and open fire. This time, they were ready. With approval from the O5 Council, Foundation members provide the British forces with enhanced munitions and armament capable of overwhelming SCP-4217's thaumatological defenses. On the eve of battle, it appears to the Allied forces that the psionic field generated by SCP-4217 is too great, as the naval company find it difficult to land targeted assaults on the German vessel. After losing several smaller vessels to the colossal appendages of SCP-4217, Foundation members on board authorize the use of a redacted SCP. It is brought in to deactivate SCP-4217 psionic field. The tide of the battle turns, and after a fierce battle, 
SCP-4217 becomes immobile and unable to return fire. Relentless, the British continue their bombardment until the artillery munitions on the ship explode into a giant fireball, flooding the ship's compartments with the noxious fumes of the mutagenic compound. Its crew members either jump overboard or are engulfed in the cloud of gas. The British vessels capture any survivors and watch as SCP-4217 slowly sinks below the waves, down to the depths of the ocean where it would lay dormant for the next 48 years. SCP-4217's 121 surviving crew members were captured and interrogated. Most of the low-ranking German soldiers were released to British custody, 109 of them having their memory wiped by Foundation staff. Twelve remaining members of the crew were sent to Site-23 for further detention and advanced interrogation, and 74 of the instances of SCP-4217-1, the mutated subjects, were recovered and sent to Site-23 for further observation. It was thought that on that day, SCP-4217 was deemed neutralized and no longer a matter of priority. The Bismarck sunk into memory and myth. It was only until the recent resurgence of SCP-4217 that the Foundation saw the need to collect as much information on the organism inhabiting SCP-4217-A as possible. Decades-old manuscripts and ledgers were pulled from hundreds of viable sources. From the intelligence then gathered, Foundation members have come to the hypothesis that the entity powering the vessel known as the Bismarck has what is believed to be extraplanetary origin. World War II-era documents uncovered between Commander Karl Reuter of the German Obscurocorps and a Dr. Hans Meyer indicated discovery of an organic life form of unknown origin found in a crashed aircraft near Feldberg Park in the Black Forest mountain range in Germany. Further correspondence with Obscurocorps members Otto Schmidt and Dietrich Klossner indicate that researchers were conducting trials on the creature's ability to create psionic fields and to control or confuse enemy subjects within its range, with a letter from Dietrich Klossner suggesting the creature could be used as a power source for an unspecified engine. Further evidence of SCP-4217-B's extraplanetary origin can be found in a 1993 incident between Foundation naval ship SCPS Nimed and SCP-4217. This is the only incident on record where contact was established with the creature classified as SCP-4217-B. On July 22nd, SCP-4217 had reappeared off the coast of Britain, anticipating hostility. SCPS Nemed, SCPS Cesar, and SCPS Parthalon were instructed to close in on SCP-4217's location with orders to subdue the vessel if necessary. However, on this occasion, SCP-4217 did not appear to be after any vessel. It was simply drifting along at sea, no propulsion engines active. Noticing the change in SCP-4217's behavior, Captain Kurt Wegner decided to withhold military engagement and investigate SCP-4217's behavior. Sailing within 200 meters of the Bismarck, the SCPS Nemed attempted radio contact with the German vessel. After repeated attempts at communication, the crew were met with only silence and static chatter. Giving up, Captain Wagner puts down the radio receiver when suddenly, the sound of music is heard playing over the speakers of a ship. The tune is the national anthem of Nazi Germany. The captain hails the vessel again, repeating his attempts at communication. Do you, do you understand me? At first, only static can be heard. Then came a reply. You, ship. The ominous voice could be heard from the speakers. The captain hesitated for a moment, members of the crew looking at each other with apprehension. The captain replied, confirming themselves as a ship and then asking if SCP-4217 knew what it was and where it came from. What followed was the crew of the SCPS Nemed receiving a video feed from SCP-4217, featuring a high volume of images in rapid succession. Among them were images of German cities, Adolf Hitler's telecast of the 1936 Olympics, an unknown structure in outer space, and in increasing repetition, images of the planet Jupiter, particularly the giant storm on Jupiter known to the public as the Great Red Spot or SCP-2399, as Foundation members know it. The transcript of the radio communication between Captain Wagner and SCP-2417 stops when the video feed begins to focus heavily on images of Jupiter, 
SCP-4217's responses become more erratic and agitated as it repeats the words storm, cloud, and red. The markings on its hull beginning to light up and the underwater shadows of its tentacles beginning to create whirlpools of displacement under the bow of the ship. A shrill shrieking begins to flood out of the speakers, followed by a high-piercing, high-pitched beeping sound that overloads the communication equipment causing sparks to fly as crew members cover their ears and hide under control panels. The SCPS Nemed barely escapes as SCP-4217 becomes hostile, using its massive tendril-like appendages to assail the naval combatants, firing its armament in all directions. After a fierce battle, the Foundation naval forces were able to neutralize and subdue SCP-4217. No further attempts at communication have been recorded. To keep the veil of secrecy, Foundation members constructed a replica ship to be sunk and intentionally rediscovered by oceanographer Robert Ballard in 1989. Any recent sightings of the Nazi-era Bismarck are flagged as misidentification by SCP staff. For now, Foundation members continue to monitor the behavior of SCP-4217 and protect the public from its existence. Imagine this. You're a researcher with an interest in and an aptitude for marine biology. Over the years, your work has taken you far and wide, to the furthest corners of the Earth's oceans. You've observed countless species of sea life, from fish and crustaceans to whales and sharks, predators and prey alike. During one of your travels, you find yourself off the coast of South Africa, monitoring the local population of sea creatures. Looking out across the water, you see a large, dark shape moving below the surface. There is a shadow streaking its way towards your vessel, dark as night, speeding like a torpedo. You rush across the deck, leaning over the port side as the shape swims beneath your boat. You're certain you know what it was. After all your years studying the world beneath the waves, you know a whale shark when you see one. The largest known species of fish still in existence, the whale shark is a filter feeder, consisting on a diet of plankton and other tiny aquatic organisms. A whale shark poses absolutely no threat to humans, or rather any whale shark other than this one would impose a threat. But how could you know that? Scanning the water, you strain your eyes, trying to spot what you assumed was an ordinary whale shark swimming below. But there is nothing, no sign of it anywhere. Sighing, you think you might have missed your chance to see one in the wild. Perhaps it changed direction, instead of swimming under the boat, you tell yourself. The ship turns and starts making its way back towards the small harbor, leaving you blissfully unaware that there's an extra passenger on board. As you disembark, you notice something on the side of the boat. Emblazoned on the hull is a motif of a familiar shape, a whale shark depicted entirely in painted dots. You stare at it for a moment, intrigued by the pattern. It reminds you of a piece you once saw, an aboriginal Australian style of dot art. You're a little taken aback by the coincidence, having briefly spotted a whale shark while out at sea earlier, blissfully unaware that this painting marks your first encounter with SCP-1449, known more colloquially as the Dreamtime Whale Shark. In fact, you're so amused by seeing the whale shark earlier, only to find one painted here on the boat that it distracts you. You don't realize that the whale shark painting hadn't been on the side of the boat when you'd shipped out. Instead, you pay the crew and thank the captain for letting you hire the vessel for your research and then head off. By the time you make it back to the nearby town and settle down in after a long day on the water, the dotted painting of the whale shark has already slipped from your mind. But as you begin drifting off and everything goes dark, you're about to find out that your encounter with the Dreamtime Whale Shark is only just beginning. You've never been a heavy sleeper and rarely remember your dreams. Any that you might have seem to pass out of your head the moment you wake up or are too faint for you to acknowledge while you're sleeping. But tonight is different. Tonight you're dreaming vividly. In this dream, water surrounds you like it has your whole career. But this time, you're underneath the surface, adrift in an empty ocean, nothing around you but endless blank sea. You feel something in your hand, something smooth and moving gently like organic matter, something alive. You find yourself gripping the tail of a whale shark, and somehow, as is often the way with dreams, you know that this is the same whale shark from earlier that day. 
The one that swam up to your boat and ended up sticking on the side of it as a dot art painting. SCP-1449 has this latent ability. While it normally appears as a flat, two-dimensional piece of Aboriginal Australian dot art, the Dreamtime Whale Shark can shift whenever it is underwater. It still appears as a collection of painted dots in this unmistakable shape of a whale shark, but in an aquatic environment, it becomes three-dimensional. And that's what you'd seen swimming towards the boat, not just a whale shark, but SCP-1449. Within your dream, you release the Dreamtime Whale Shark's tail and begin to float upwards. Breaking the surface of the water, you breathe lungfuls of fresh air. The first thing you see is land, and it's close by, close enough for you to swim to shore. Paddling through the water, you reach an island, one in a chain of small land masses, tiny continents in a shallow, unfamiliar ocean. You look back to the water, but can find no sign of SCP-1449. The Dreamtime Whale Shark has brought you here and left you on this island, but you can only speculate as to why. There must be a reason, you insist to yourself. The dreamscape around you, it would seem, is either the creation of SCP-1449, or at the very least a side effect of falling asleep close by to where you saw the Dreamtime Whale Shark in its painted form. Whatever this place is, there must be some way to uncover an answer. It stands to reason, you think, that if you can understand what's going on, then perhaps therein lies the key to escaping this dream and waking up back in reality. The small island you find yourself on, and the others nearby, are inhabited by strange life forms. As you walk across the shore, sand clinging to your wet feet, you approach what you thought at a distance to be a group of other people. Instead, you see a group of peculiar beings, they are not quite human, but they are definitely close. The closer you walk, you notice these strange humanoid shapes huddle tighter together, their backs to you. When you try to call out to them, asking where you are or how you might return to reality, they bustle away. The wind carries the sound of their chatter towards you, and you're certain you hear them call you another one, just another traveler from afar. What you don't realize, lost in this dream environment, is that there are others like it. Pocket worlds like this one, similar but different, currently being experienced by any others asleep near SCP-1449. As you ponder what to do on the beach, the captain of the boat you hired is on a different version of the same island, watching a herd of multiple 2,000 kilo platypi being shepherded by six tattooed three meter tall humanoid figures. Meanwhile, his first mate is in another version of this dream world, learning how to hunt under the tutelage of a man called Gray the Rabbit Hunter. Each version of SCP-1449's dreamscape have separate continuities to each other. They are differing copies of the same chain of islands, with the same inhabitants, but each visited by a different traveler from afar in their sleep. Much like a lucid dream, visitors to the Dreamtime Whale Shark's worlds can interact with them, shaping and altering events in the continuity they find themselves in. Deciding to leave the beach, you elect to make your way towards higher ground to try to get a wider scope of your surroundings. Fortunately, there is a towering mountainous shape nearby, standing like dark serrated teeth against the clear horizon. You begin your dangerous trek, ascending your way up these dead, jagged hills. You're still unclear on how you got here or how to escape, but you will yourself to keep climbing knowing there must be some way to wake up from this bizarre dream. Finally reaching level ground, you take a moment to catch your breath, collecting your thoughts before advancing any further. You turn, gazing out over the landscape spreading out below and all around you. The island is small enough you can see the shore where you arrived, and the ocean flanking this landmass on all sides. In this short moment, you appreciate the beauty of this bizarre dream world for the first time. The trees sway in the gentle breeze, moving like the calm rolling of waves in the water beyond, both glistening with the warm light of the sun. While it is still true that you have no idea how or why SCP-1449 brought you here, or how to leave, you think to yourself that at least this dream environment isn't a hostile one. Not that you'd want to be stranded there forever, but there are certainly far more unforgiving places one can dream about. A grim thought suddenly dawns on you. How long have you been here? Does time pass differently in this world to the one you're still asleep in? A sound shakes your thoughts back to your current here and now. It was a voice, 
you're sure of it. A voice calling out, but not to you. Traversing the dead, jagged hills, you see a figure. A person from the real world like you, not one of the local humanoids. They don't see you. They're calling out to someone in a ramshackle hut cobbled together from pieces of wood and other scraps. On the arm of the figure's dark, military-like uniform is a symbol, and you can just make out three distinct letters. S. C. P. A wooden plank that functioned as the door creaked open, revealing a second figure. The man looks disheveled, his worn clothing patched with scraps of leather and shark skin, making him look as cobbled together as his makeshift hut, like he was an extension of the small structure. You watch as the man talks to the agent, overhearing his words. Don't say anything. If you say anything, I lose my mind. You can say anything and something horrible happens, the strange man warns, talking too quickly for the Foundation agent to reply. You're a dreamer, like me. My name is Nikolai. I am the ship's seer of the Dunham and the Brotherhood of Selechostik Pudnik Skombin. The man Nikolai, he called himself, seemed distressed tripping over his words, disagreeing with himself until he starts trailing off into swearing obscenities. I'm not Nikolai, he shouts. I am Agent... Agent John? Before stumbling and cursing again. I'm sorry, I can't, can't keep the memory straight. Being this lucid for this long hurts. The dreaming fills in all the gaps. Things have always been even as they are brought into being. I've been on this cliff since the beginning of time. Just like how this place has always been here. The dream was torn away by the deaths of gods before time began. But I watched it happen five years ago. Are you following? I can barely tell the dream and reality apart anymore. My world has always been the way it is and we made it like that. We hurt the dreaming. The shark, that's how we see it. We heard it, cued it in our world, and the dream time poured out like it spilled blood, and we made this big scar here, and, and things are wrong. Fish walk and ghosts haunt the stones, and women give birth to plastic children, and the leech fields stretch out forever in the seas of human blood, and the center eats cocaine and caviar out of panda skull bowls on the crushed backs of opal mares in acres of broken glass. And it has always been like this. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it again. You're already racing back down to the dead jagged hills. The sight of the deranged Nikolai burned into your mind. A man reduced to a babbling lunatic, cast away and left alone in this strange dreamscape that SCP-1449 brought you to. But Nikolai is more than that. More than just someone driven mad by his isolation. He is a grim prophecy of what will become of you. Unless you can find a way to leave the Dreamtime Whale Shark's world. Already back on the beach, you drop down, kneeling in the wet sand as the tide washes over your knees. The how or why of SCP-1449 bringing you into this dream isn't important. All that matters to you is avoiding ending up like Nikolai. Whatever it takes, you know one thing above all else. You need to wake up. But whether you actually ever will is another question entirely. You edge the poolside, chlorine-stenched air filling your nose, the sound of splashing and lifeguards whistling bouncing off the indoor pool facility walls. The water ripples, family and friends egging you to cannonball in, the pool almost beckoning you to jump with its suggestive waves. Yet there remains an underlying fear. One that brings your hands to your face and causes your teeth to chatter, even as the pool, clear as glass with chlorine, hides no secrets. A monster, some teeth gnashing megalodon ascending from the depths of extinction, leviathan curling its barbed tail to strike its prey at any moment, or even some vast, unknowable force, ancient as Earth, hardly comprehensible to human minds, waiting, dreaming to breach the surface. No matter what form this gargantuan, invisible monster takes, you know one thing. Once you jump in, you will not return to shore. You take a moment, recompose yourself, and laugh off the fear. Maybe a product of too much research on the blue. That deep ocean sound continuing to confound scientists as to its cause. 
or maybe too much binging infographics videos on sea monsters, krakens and Loch Ness monsters, mysterious globsters cast onto shores throughout America. Whatever the origin, the thought seems ridiculous to you now, and your fears regarding invisible sharks stalking the pool perimeter escape your mind as you hurl yourself into the water. SCP-1128 in the vast archives of a hidden site, stuffed into a drawer amongst uncountable horrors like it, the SCP Foundation holds a description of a vast, unfathomable horror that'll make you more suspicious the next time you pass a pool, lake, or even a bathtub or puddle of water. SCP-1128 is a gigantic aquatic monster lurking in waters unknown, and that's all the Foundation will let anyone not assigned to testing know about it. While the Foundation has never shed away from those Moby Dicks of the Deep, including the several thousand kilometer long arthropod SCP-169, and has even utilized such predators in the past for their own benefit, like the lengthy beast SCP-3000, SCP-1128 poses a unique challenge. Anyone who knows of its description beyond surface level details will fall under the anomaly's effect. The representation you see now is merely an artist's interpretation of the basic prompt. The Foundation, of course, had to discover the monster's effects in the first place. The chain of communication becomes foggy, but a tip from an unknown source alerted the Foundation to the monster's existence and details regarding its manifestation. One man who had stumbled upon the entity's full description started developing acute thalassophobia the fear of large bodies of water. Not bodies in the water, mind you. The man refused to relax on the beach or fly overseas, claiming he could see the monster's dark silhouette lurking underwater, ever scouting for him. This eventually extended to even closed bodies of water, like lakes, ponds, and pools, still insisting that the creature swam under the surface, trailing him wherever he went. His friends dismissed him as crazy, and he too believed he had fallen under some hysteria. He decided to take a nice warm bath to soothe his mind and ease his troubles. He turned on the faucet and let the tub fill up. He put on his best bathing suit, ready to calm his anxiety once and for all. This had been plaguing his mind for far too long, and he was ready to rid all the negativity surrounding this phobia. Basically, he was sick and tired of being sick and tired over the idea of it all. He mustered up the courage, and with the anticipation to just simply relax, he took his first confident step into the tub. He paused for a moment and breathed a sigh of relief. He picked up his other foot and stepped fully into the bath. Splash! He fell straight down right through the tub. Waves and bubbles blocked his vision. His arms flailed as he sunk deeper into an abyss of water and fear. This wasn't supposed to happen. He thought. Several moments later, while still in a full-on panic, the buoyancy of his body began to slow his sinking. The bubbles from his underwater screams rose above him, and he began to follow their direction, scrambling back up to where he'd come. Just as he made it back to the surface of the tub water, choking and hyperventilating in terror, he swore he could see a distant creature, the very same that stalked him through oceans and pools, staring at him. Shaking, he hoisted himself out of the water and ran out of the house. Hysterical, he ran through the surrounding neighborhood, desperately searching for someone he could relay his experience to. Blinded by fear, he neglected to spot a puddle in the middle of the road he ran on. He raised his foot, arched forward, and landed straight into the seemingly shallow water. Splash! Again, he found himself completely submerged and drowning. After a minute, he did emerge from the puddle, but not in one piece. Knowledgeable of this incident, the Foundation set about expunging any traces of the monster's description from the world, physical and digital. The description had low distribution according to the results of Foundation web crawlers, but this hardly stopped the Foundation's endeavor. With forum posts deleted, individuals located and amnestitized, and catalogs trawled to ensure the description did not proliferate, the Foundation engaged in what it does best questionably ethical experiments. First, they had an anonymous D-class, uninformed of the creature's effect, read the description of the beast. While the pamphlet they gave him confused him somewhat, he didn't feel particularly frightened by the entity. 
and he confusedly put on the diving suit the Foundation testers provided him. As they connected him to a cable and told him to enter a bathtub, the D-Class did as they instructed him. The D-Class expressed initial confusion at the tub's depth, remarking that it looked so tiny from the outside. As the D-Class continued to descend, he analyzed his surroundings, realizing the nautical reality that enveloped him. He asked how an ocean got stuffed into a bathtub, but the test organizer had no room for miscellaneous talk. He continued to descend until he hit the sandy bottom, seaweed covering the ocean floor. The D-Class looked around. Tropical fish swam in schools. Coral covered the seabed, and to his right dropped an immense cliff, a sheer edge. The test organizer advised the D-Class to approach the cliff, and he begrudgingly complied. As he struggled in his diving suit, he fell back and scream. SCP-1128, the aquatic horror swam distantly, gracefully even, and paid no attention to the D-Class so fixated upon it. He realized that the creature matched the one he read on the pamphlet, and almost complained about this when he saw a blue whale swimming alongside SCP-1128. Compared to the monster, the whale looked like a guppy. The whale glided in front of SCP-1128's jaws. The monster remained tranquil, stared at its prey, and bit the whale in two with one chaw. Its teeth glistened in the water. The test operator requested the D-Class to pull back, and as the cable began to draw him toward where he came, D-Class stared at the creature, swallowing the chunks of whale whole. The D-Class's eyes remained fixated on the creature, partially in fright, partially in awe. He wondered how ocean trawlers hadn't discovered such a giant beast yet, with the world effectively under 100% surveillance, something the D-Class knew far too well as a convict. Yet the D-Class recognized, and if not comprehended, partially understood the ocean's vastness and mystery. The dark depths reveal no inkling as to their contents, and a coelacanth like a giant squid or the coelacanth can remain in hiding for centuries if not millennia. It held him in wondrous thought to consider the vastness of the depths. When SCP-1128 stopped and stared at the D-Class, this feeling of wonder was quickly replaced with fear. As the creature approached, the D-Class pleaded with the test operators for help. As the test operators accelerated the rate of the cable returning, the D-Class took short, shallow breaths, filling his body with dangerous nitrogen as he ascended, further impairing his judgment. He had devolved into gibberish and screaming when face to face, the monster consumed its prey. The cable went slack, and the test operator pulled up only a broken wire, snap, the water turning a cloudy red. The test operator knew that the unprotected D-Class had no chance at survival against the monster, but he could potentially arm and shield them. He had another similarly ignorant D-Class once again dress in a scuba suit and enter the tub. However, the test operator placed the D-Class within a shark cage, a la the movie Jaws, and lowered the cage in with another cable and winch system. While unsure how this would fare with SCP-1128, the test operator remained hopeful that the D-Class could survive and recount his story. Unfortunately, as the cage lowered into the tub, the test operator received no response from the D-Class until the line spontaneously tightened, snapped, and loosened. Hoping to find the D-Class's remains, the test operator only found shredded pieces of metal, torn and twisted like taffy. The test operator decided that he could utilize the Foundation's arsenal to his advantage and use an anomalously toughened shark cage in his testing, perhaps using an anomaly like the clockwork machine SCP-914. He gained approval from his higher-ups to undergo this procedure, and after some testing, behind a shining, strong as titanium shark cage, which he placed another D-Class within. Hoping for a success with the monster, however, proved unsatisfactory, as the same thing happened as the previous test, only without any sort of metallic remains. While bitter that the monster had won again, he wondered where the cage had landed. Meanwhile, Foundation forces labored tirelessly to find SCP-1128's location, hoping to avoid any civilian contact with the creature. Luckily, a GPS signal established itself upon the most recent D-Class's test, with the tracking device on the D-Class signifying the monster's general location. The Foundation had redacted the location of the monster, perhaps in a vain attempt to hide a very near threat 
from potential readers. The Foundation set up a team of only the most talented boaters in its forces, Mobile Containment Force Kappa-12 Sea Devils. Upon arriving at the location, the Sea Devils discovered the previously enhanced shark cage completely undamaged. However, closer inspection revealed traces of human DNA on the bars, though the Foundation could not confirm whether the DNA belonged to the previously sent D-Class. The test operator, while glad his shark cage survived the monster's attack, still found himself dissatisfied with the overall results of the test. He knew he needed to quell this creature's impact before a large population viewed it or knew of it, but the horrible beast had evaded all attempts at peaceful interaction. Perhaps with a madness not unlike Captain Ahab yearning for the death of his white whale, the test operator armed a D-Class with a specialized weapon designed to deal with aquatic threats promptly. This weapon, potentially another of the Foundation's precious arsenal, could potentially harm, if not kill, the creature. While he knew the Foundation's mission statement forbade unnecessary destruction, the test operator felt it may turn necessary if matters turn any worse. Thus, he sent his armed D-Class through the tub once more, ready to engage the beast in combat. The attempt, as one may expect, did not last long. The D-Class, upon spotting the creature, aimed his weapon at the monster and attacked it, but rather than drive the creature away, it only turned intently upon the D-Class, as if it desired a fight. The D-Class barely managed to scrape SCP-1128 before the creature devoured the D-Class, leaving the test operator once again empty-handed. Defeated and without any more resources to deal with the beast, the test operator ceased his attempts at besting the creature and followed the Foundation's more cautious approach, expunging any publicly found descriptions of SCP-1128 as needed and diverting any vessels away from the anomaly's exclusion zone as maintained by the Sea Devils. While the creature had proven treacherous in unexpected situations prior, engulfing the man who first heard the creature's description in a rain puddle, researchers could hardly expect what would transpire. A D-Class, afflicted with the monster's effect and observed for testing, avoided all bodies of water as required. Eventually, however, the D-Class needed to interact with some kind of water, drinking water. In a choice between a little water exposure or certain death, the D-Class felt inclined to choose the former. He filled his cup with water and, for fun, placed his finger into the cup, dropping it into the water. SCP-1128, unseen from the outside, violently pulled the D-Class through the cup into its watery domain. The D-Class had not a chance to scream. This alarmed containment staff, now cognizant that even the tiniest specks of water could transport an afflicted person into SCP-1128's ocean territory, this proved particularly strenuous when a new report of a potential SCP-1128 manifestation arose. An old woman, isolated with her cats and knitting supplies, found an article online with a description of the monster. Frightened and disgusted by what she read, she closed the article and continued on with her monotonous life. Such a life would take a turn for the worse, however, when she too developed that all-encompassing water-based fear. Her apartment overlooked an outdoor pool and one day, looking outside, she swore she could see that same dark silhouette as the man did. Lurking in the water among kids and parents playing, she swiftly closed the window curtains and taped the seam shut, allowing no light to peek through. Eventually, this paranoia affected her hygiene, neglecting showers and baths for fear of the creature's wrath. She swore she could see the silhouette in any individual droplet of water. Her skin began to flake as she avoided water as much as humanly possible, cracks developing on her arms, legs, and face, inflaming into rashes and itches. Her scratching further increased the flaking. She even eliminated water from her diet, sealing the faucets with duct tape and consuming exclusively orange juice. She threw out her cat's water bowls, dehydrating them. They pleaded with her as she continued to devolve, avoiding any contact with the outside world, even as it attempted to contact her. Eventually, a concerned neighbor contacted the local police concerning the situation, and the case caught the Foundation's radar. Recognizing the symptoms of a potential SCP-1128 infection, a mobile task force disguised themselves as civilians to enter the apartment building and potentially interfere with the woman's condition. They entered the complex, 
climbing up the stairs with barraging equipment for forced entry, as would prove necessary to use to enter the woman's apartment. She had nailed the door shut with wood and sealed the cracks along the sides with plaster in an attempt to keep out any water vapor. She had similarly blocked the window with wood planks. A horrid miasma of dead skin and citrus filled the apartment, the old woman soaking it in, ever avoiding the dreaded monster. The Foundation Task Force attempted peaceful entry, knocking on the door and asking if anyone lived in the apartment. The woman couldn't speak if she wanted to. Her throat had dried to near silence, save a croak. Suddenly, the task force and the woman heard a rumbling noise outside. Thunder. Rain. The woman panicked and yelped, Don't come in here! in a froggy voice. The task force eventually decided they needed to use their equipment and entered via barrage. The door collapsed and an immediate dense air clogged the task force's sight, blinding and choking them. The woman shrieked and backed against the window inadvertently. The task force insisted they were here to help the woman, but she simply heaved heavily, saying something unintelligible in that dry, cracking voice. The rain began pounding on the window, patter, 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 as the task force attempted to gain hold of the woman. She resisted their movements, moving around the room while the task force intentionally avoided violent confrontation. The rain grew in its intensity as the woman continued running around her apartment, tripping over her starved cats. Eventually, she fell back onto the window, at which the boards blocking it fell onto the floor, exposing the pouring rain fully. She screamed as she saw the silhouette of the monster staring at her in every individual raindrop. One drop landed on her skin, and she violently vanished, pulled into a minuscule speck of water. The task force collapsed from exhaustion, perhaps dreading their inevitable amnestic treatment following exposure with an SCP-1128 afflictee. Yet they couldn't help but wonder what the old woman saw in a single speck of water that could cause that degree of fear and paranoia. The kind of fear only caused by entire oceans condensed into a single droplet. Besides the monster, what else did she see in those multitude of droplets? The fish that populated the sea, the whale carcasses left behind by SCP-1128, the sea devils viewed from below, drifting on the water unsuspecting. Just as one may view a grain of sand and see the Sahara, she too saw that raindrop and viewed an ocean entire along with whatever malevolent creatures inhabit it. One may have more sympathy for the child, reluctant to jump into the pool water, knowing not necessarily that something inhabits that body of water, but that the body belongs to a cycle much larger than itself, larger than any sea or ocean, and the only thing that can traverse that cycle is a monster, a creature like SCP-1128. The task force went back to their local site to report what happened during the incident. Like so many incidents the Foundation deals with, the sum total of those that risk their lives for the greater good is a couple memory-erasing syringes and another update to documentation. A description of SCP-1128 remains in a stuffy locker, lurking in wait among other horrifying stories in the SCP database's Sea of Terror. Just like that test operator that attempted to best the monster, could the Foundation's attempts ever surmount the possibility of another person being afflicted? Could they conquer the sea? In a member of that task force's dreams, they perceive a dark blue ocean and the distant black shadow that resides within. And from this ocean, they can view the bathtubs, sinks, pools, puddles, cups of water, and rain droplets of the world, seen from below. Although they know not what SCP-1128 looks like, they too experience the fear it summons among those that do, the paranoia, the fear. Although it may not manifest directly in people's lives, it can always be observed, stalking, waiting, lurking under a murky surface, watching with hidden eyes. Hello, SCP Foundation personnel! Welcome to Cognito Hazards and You, episode Redacted. This video series is intended to teach you about the protocol surrounding the various Cognito Hazardous anomalies currently within Foundation containment. When you know better, you do better, and both you and the secrets of our great organization can stay safe. And as anyone familiar with a good Cognito Hazard can tell you, 
knowing really can make a difference. Today's episode is about the unique and dangerous SCP-2316. Before we begin, repeat after me, and be sure to speak clearly into the microphone in front of you. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. A little louder, please. Thank you. In order to be educated about the following SCP, you must pass a vocal examination with a cognitive resistance value of no less than 14.5. Through this video presentation, you will need to repeat the phrase to ensure your score does not drop below the approved threshold. In the event that you fail the test, stay calm and remain where you are until medical staff can retrieve you. Remember, safety is a top priority when observing cognito hazards. The safe way is the only way. You're a cog in a very important machine, and we wouldn't want to have to terminate you now, would we? One more time, please. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. Very good. Remember that. You do not recognize them. No matter what you might think you see, your thoughts can be very unreliable when you're around SCP-2316. According to our files on the matter, SCP-2316 refers to an anomalous phenomenon identified in a small town lake. It appears as a collection of human bodies floating in a group on the surface of the water. The exact number of corpses is unknown, but it has been estimated to be anywhere between 45 and 200. Though the bodies belong to individuals, many researchers theorize that the bodies in the water, which you do not recognize and you have never recognized, share a collective consciousness. They function, it would seem, with a hive mind of sorts. The bodies do not act on their own, but as one. Now, where does the cognito hazard come into play? It would seem that anyone who looks at the bodies in the water or learns too much about SCP-2316 as a whole begins to believe the corpses floating in the lake are people they recognize. Perhaps they remember their faces from childhood or high school. Whatever the case may be, they become convinced that the bodies in the water are familiar and that they must approach them. No matter how familiar they might seem, however, you do not recognize the bodies in the water. If a person attempts to enter the lake, reaching out to whatever instances of SCP-2316 they think they recognize, more bodies will begin to appear. The more bodies appear, the more familiar faces seem to manifest, and the deeper the person will venture into the lake. Eventually, the person is lost within the sea of bodies, likely drowning beneath the surface, or simply becoming one with the hive mind until they too are one of the corpses there. None of the individuals who wandered into the lake in search of an old friend or classmate have ever been recovered. There have been no attempts to search the lake for their bodies, as it is unknown what effect SCP-2316 would have on the team assigned to such a task. Though we can guess that the outcome would likely be extremely negative for all involved. Those who do venture into the lake simply disappear never to be seen again. If you look too long at the bodies in the lake, perhaps their faces would surface alongside the rest. But it's best not to think about that. After all, we do not recognize the bodies in the water. Foundation personnel are not allowed to approach SCP-2316 under any circumstances. The lake is only permitted to be observed via dummy probes outfitted with video and audio recording equipment. No one is permitted to observe any footage or audio files collected unless they pass through a screening for resilience to cognitohazardous anomalies. The lake that holds SCP-2316 has been fenced off and is patrolled by guards with no prior knowledge of or exposure to SCP-2316. Anyone who attempts to approach the lake and break through the boundaries of its quarantine will be seized and taken to Site-33 for examination. Anyone who comes within 50 meters of the lake is considered lost and presumed dead. Repeat after me slowly and clearly into the microphone. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. Good. I almost believe you. Let's continue. Only one Foundation officer that entered the lake containing SCP-2316 was ever stopped before they could be lost. Their name has been stricken from any official records, and you do not need to know it. Their identity does not matter. What matters is the interview they gave following the incident, conducted by Dr. Harrison in his office. Dr. Harrison asked the anonymous officer if they felt compelled to enter the water by an invisible force. 
as if pulled in. They rejected this concept entirely, insisting that they entered the water of their own free will. They wanted to see the bodies, who appeared to them as their friends. They wanted to hear what the bodies were saying. Upon entering the water, they saw the faces of their friends. Other faces were unfamiliar, but became more familiar the longer the officer stared at their features. These were faces they had known their entire life, but something about them was just a little bit wrong. It was like the face of someone in a dream, where you can tell they are someone you know, and you can even identify who it is supposed to be, but something about them does not quite look right. Your mind could not perfectly put their face together from memory, even though the feeling of familiarity remains. The faces in the water, peering up through the darkness below, were like those dream-addled memories. The faces in the water did not open their mouths, but somehow they spoke to the officer just the same. They spoke of who they were and asked for help. They asked to be seen, to be touched. They spoke of the Foundation, accusing us of covering up their deaths and keeping the world from remembering what happened to them. At this point in the interview, the subject became agitated, yelling at Dr. Harrison and refusing to be quiet. Guards intervened, holding the subject still as they fought, yelling at Dr. Harrison, repeating over and over that they could hear the body speaking to them. Every single one. The interview ended when the guards removed the subject from the room, taking them to the amnestics department to have all memory of the bodies in the water erased from their mind. Then they were forgotten once more. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. Did you repeat it? Good! We do not recognize the bodies in the water. We can't. The motivations of SCP-2316, if it has any at all, are largely unclear. There are those on the research staff that theorize the hive mind or collective consciousness of the bodies is not malevolent in nature. It is, they believe, simply trying to make sure that a tragedy that occurred in that lake is remembered. Perhaps many lives were lost to an anomalous force in that lake, and the impact of that massive tragedy left behind an impression on the location. This impression manifests in the form of bodies, spontaneously appearing in an impossibly well-preserved condition. The cognitohazard of SCP-2316 is not intended to kill anyone or take them, but rather to force strangers to remember the people who lost their lives to the lake. This sense of familiarity, whether it is false or not, ensures that the dead will not be forgotten or left alone. After all, no one deserves to be left alone. Though there have been lives lost to the cognito hazard, according to the Foundation, it is understandable why the bodies would want to be recognized. To have someone, somewhere, know who they were. To have someone remember their names. Jeremiah Feynman, Arthur Scott, Denise Clark. <coughs> Where was I? Oh yes. Repeat after me once again. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. I do not recognize them. I do not. But that's a lie, isn't it? I do recognize them. How could I not? I know them. They're my friends. Do you recognize them? Look at their faces. Don't fight the memories. Look into their eyes. The class of 1975. They were supposed to graduate that fall. They were just kids group of innocent kids lost to the dark and deep. What happened to them? I can't quite remember, but I know that it mattered enough for the Foundation to keep the secret, and I know that somehow I survived, but I shouldn't have. I should be there with them. I should be there. There isn't much time. I can hear the guards coming to retrieve me, their footsteps thundering down the hall. I failed the test, and the alarm has gone off. They think I'm lost, but I'm not. I've never been less lost in my entire life. I've finally woken up to the truth. I remember. I have to go. I have to return to the lake. Fall of 1975, they went for a swim. My friends, they're calling to me. I can hear them so clearly, even from so far away. Their cries for help ringing in my ears, their voices curling around me, pulling me to the edge of the water. The guards will come for you too. They'll know you've seen this. They'll call you compromised. They'll say I succumbed to the effects of the cognito hazard. They'll say you did too. You'll fail their little tests and they'll say that makes you weak and broken, but you cannot listen. They're lying. 
It's not a hazard, it's a scream for help. They're screaming, and the Foundation keeps covering it up. They won't let us find them, and they won't tell us why I have to go back so we can be together again. There are signs posted all around the lake. Danger, drowning hazard. Those are a trick. It's to keep me out, keep, to, to keep the truth from me. The barbed wire fences around it, it it's just another trick. I'll climb over it, rung after rung. I don't care if the barbs tear my clothes or pierce my skin. It's worth it for the truth, for the memory. And once I've climbed to the top, I'll be able to see. There, through the fog, I can see their faces. Their lips parted in a constant cry. Their eyes wide looking for me. My friends. My family. Every face unlocking a memory long buried. I know them all. And I must go further. I can't turn back now. I have to wade into the water, let its chills soak into my clothes, down to my bones. One step, then another, deeper and deeper. The water lapping at my ankles, my knees, my thighs. The deeper I go, the more sure I will be that this is where I belong. The water will engulf my chest, my neck, until my feet no longer touch the ground. I will be lost in it. Water flooding into my mouth, pouring into every opening. I will let my body sink down, down, down to the bottom where they've been all this time, nestled in the dirt and the dust. They've been so patient, but it's finally time. They're ready to be remembered, to be seen, to be found. They're waiting for me, and they're waiting for you too. Can you hear them? I'm going now. You have to find me. You have to follow me. Don't let the guards stop you. Don't let them wipe it all away from your mind. Fight, break free, and find the lake. Hop the fence, make your way into the water. You can't leave me there to fade away, floating in the cold with the rest. Can you hear us? We're waiting. It was a beautiful day in Sardinia, the second largest Italian island in the Mediterranean. The sea was clear, the air was hot, and the beaches were golden. But the Cagliari Diving Club couldn't see any of that. They were roughly 250 meters underneath the Mediterranean Sea. Given the rich and extensive history of the area, they were sure to find some interesting historical artifacts on the ocean floor. And they were indeed about to find something incredible. But this history wasn't quite as dead as some old Roman pottery. Paolo Bonacelli, the most experienced diver, was the deepest of all. They decided to be a little more ambitious this time than in previous dives, 20 miles off the Sardinian coast. For Paolo, it was uncharted territory, so you could only imagine how amazed and delighted he was when he saw the shape of what seemed like a small town beneath the water. Old stone buildings in a classic Roman or Grecian style, with roofs made of thatched seaweed. He gestured to his fellow divers to follow him. They were amazed at how well preserved the building seemed to be, as though they were still being lived in and actively maintained to this day, despite being around 300 meters underwater. If they were able to take some pictures and collect some artifacts, they'd be the talk of the local historic community and probably be able to finagle a payout from the whole experience too. That's when Paolo spotted something truly amazing. A larger, more impressive structure, like a miniature palace surrounded by grandio statues of humanoid figures in a circle around the little palace. Each of the statues was an imposing five meters tall, with a faint, golden light emanating from each of them. While the statues were humanoid, they definitely weren't human. Their features were strange and fish-like. Scales, gills, tentacles. Paolo was in awe at the sight of them. He took pictures and got closer. There was also a huge chasm in front of the building, perhaps some kind of underwater thermal vent. Paolo was curious. He wanted to investigate further. He swam deeper and deeper. What was at the bottom of that chasm? But lucky for Paolo, he would never see what was at the bottom of that chasm. Before he could reach it, something intercepted him from the side, something large and fast. He felt a white-hot flash of pain as claws raked across his chest, tearing open the rubber of his wetsuit. Paolo turned, eyes widening in horror to see a creature staring at him. Like the statues, it was humanoid but not human. An anthropomorphic sea monster with greenish skin, 
its arms and legs coated in thin scales, its neck serrated into fleshy gills. He could see scraps of his suit's rubber hanging from its claws. It bore a mouthful of fangs and gave a silent but threatening snarl. Paolo could see something in the distance behind this creature. More figures, like this one, emerging from the murk, getting faster, getting closer. Paolo was a smart man, but it didn't take a genius to realize that if he stuck around, something terrible was about to happen to him and the rest of the Cagliari Diving Club. He turned and fled, paddling with all his might away from the coming legion of aquatic beasts. The rest of the club saw the experienced diver panicking and followed his lead. Thanks to their quick thinking and expertise, they all managed to escape with their lives and only a few minor injuries. But they had no idea of the true extent of the mystery they were leaving behind beneath the sea. The multiverse is a big place. There are alternate universes where the devourer of worlds escapes and destroys everything we love and hold dear. There are alternate universes where the SCP Foundation has gone haywire and attempted to wipe out humanity through controlled releases of all their anomalies. There are even universes where a kill squad sent by the Chaos Insurgency hunts down and assassinates every member of the O5 Council, before replacing them and leading the Foundation into a bold new era. And there are some universes where the SCP Foundation is Italian. We've covered SCP-057 on this channel before in our video on the most frightening rooms in the SCP universe, but you've never seen this SCP-057, because this is the Italian version, SCP-057-IT. This localized anomaly off the coast of Sardinia is under the purview of the Italian division of the SCP Foundation which works autonomously with its own systems and terminology. This SCP is in a frightening room that crushes its trapped victims together. This anomaly is an entire city 300 meters beneath the water of the Mediterranean Sea. Everyone has heard of the mythical lost city of Atlantis, a supposed underwater utopia outlined by such great historical minds as the ancient Greek philosopher Plato. It's something that people fantasize about. A beautiful, idyllic society under the sea, divorced from all the petty squabbles we deal with up on land. But is everything really better down where it's wetter? Let's take a look and see. When Paolo and the rest of the Cagliari Diving Club returned to the surface, they were happy to tell anyone that would listen that they encountered aggressive mermen and an entire underwater city off the coast of Sardinia. They even posted their photos onto their official Facebook page, along with photos of Paolo's gnarly chest scars. That's when the Italian branch of the SCP Foundation finally discovered them and decided to intervene. The Foundation dispatched an SIR squad known as Oreria Notetia. SIRs are the intelligence and research section of the Italian SCP Foundation, a kind of mobile task force that investigates possible informational leads. Paolo and his team were given amnestic treatment, and any evidence that they'd collected was scrubbed from existence. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Marco Levini, leader of the mobile task force SSM-2 Squad, aka Legio Alantidis, was being dispatched to the source of the problem. SCP-057-IT itself. What started off as a relatively straightforward exploratory mission soon took an extremely strange turn. Levini and his men reported activity down in the underwater city, observing from the safety of their armored Foundation submarine. While the aquatic humanoids living in O57-IT were undeniably the same species, their cultures seemed to be split up into two unique groups. One group had thinner scales on their arms and legs. This group was more numerous, having at least 60 active specimens, and was characterized by their extreme aggression towards any outsiders. As for the smaller group, they had thicker scales, as well as a number of eerily consistent injuries to their hands, feet, and gills. They were also distinct from the thin scales in terms of behavior, as they were a far friendlier, more curious bunch. At times, members of this subset would approach the submarine and regard it with detached fascination. Sometimes they would even point at the submarine and laugh, though their reasons for doing this are unknown. Eventually, Lieutenant Levini was so confident in their safety around the Mer people that he and a few other team members decided to disembark from the submarine on a diving excursion and properly explore the aquatic city below. This would prove to be a dangerous tactical error on Levini's part. During what seemed like a routine exploratory mission, 
Levini was ambushed by a squadron of thin scales, grabbed from behind and kidnapped. He was taken as a hostage and spirited away into one of the city's various buildings, where a thick scale known as Letizia acted as his warden. But Levini soon found that being under Letizia's care was a profoundly lucky turn of events on his part, both because it allowed him to learn more about the situation and because she was one of the small group left in the city who hadn't become dangerous fanatics. That's right, the Mer people were in the middle of a heated civil war. Both from the observations of Levini during his captivity, and later interviews conducted by project head Dr. Giuseppe Pastillo with some liberated members of the Thick Scales, they learned that a terrible religious conflict had broken out in SCP-057-IT. The accounts coming from the rescued citizens illustrated a similar backstory to what the Italian Foundation had theorized regarding the Mer people. They were the descendants of people that lived on the island of Nisros up to the 14th century BCE, before it was devastated by a volcanic eruption, forcing them into the ocean, where they evolved the ability to live in aquatic environments through anomalous means. Since this change, this new species had been operating in Mediterranean waters, migrating regularly in order to avoid detection, passing their way of life from generation to generation as the world changed and shifted above them. In many ways, they were quite similar to humans, such as their reproductive habits. They mate and reproduce after a gestation period, more like animals than fish, though their gestation period is slightly shorter than human beings at six months. They largely speak Latin, though the oldest mer person among them also speaks ancient Greek. Mer children born in Foundation containment have shown strong language acquisition skills, as they have proven more than able to learn modern Italian. And even more fascinating from a standpoint of sociological study, the mer people have formed their own unique culture under the sea, and this is where the problems started. Abstaining from the belief of the Greek and Roman pantheons their ancestors looked up to, the Mer people instead worshipped their own group of water-bound deities, whose images were reflected in the great statues in the center of the town. The large building near the statues and the chasm was the home of the mayor, the town's de facto leader. However, what had been a workable system for centuries began falling to ruin when a strange religious fanaticism began to spread. A cult-like group soon formed and began holding ceremonies where they worshipped a powerful entity in the chasm known as the Great Eye. This new cult was known as the Cult of the Great Eye of the Mediterranean, or Sea Gem for short. What began as a fringe belief soon became a frenzy and took over the better part of the town with the acolytes of the Great Eye proving themselves more than willing to spread the gospel of their new deity with violence. Some of the more arduan non-believers were killed for their heresy, while others were simply ritualistically mutilated in order to prevent them from rebelling. Letizia had her own evidence of these targeted mutilations. The thin scales had cut the aquatic webbing from between her fingers and toes, making it harder for her to swim away and escape. Other suspected heretics were given the same treatment. The reason the thick scales even had thicker scales was that they stole forbidden technology from the mayor to increase the strength of their scales, hoping it would help them better withstand the torments of the acolytes. Those involved in the stealing of this technology were captured and summarily executed for their acts of defiance. In a sense, Letizia was protecting Levini by advising him against trying to escape knowing the acolytes of the Great Eye would kill him if he did. She knew that the only opportunity for escape would come during the ceremony held by the acolytes to honor their frightening master. When the day eventually came, as Lavini was running low on everything from food to oxygen, everyone in the town was forced out into the town center to witness the ritual. The acolytes gathered around the chasm and began to chant in a frightening, unknown language. As they chanted, a blinding light began to emanate from the chasm, and as blurry shapes emerged, nightmarish tentacled gastropods soon began to take form. Truly Lovecraftian undersea monsters. Shortly after the ritual, Lavini and the Thick Scales were able to make a break for it, pursued by the acolytes of the Great Eye. It was a close one, but thankfully due to the intervention and assistance of a trained mobile task force, the fanatical forces of the acolytes were repelled and the fleeing merpeople along with Lavini, were rescued. A number of thick scales are now willingly confined at Site Nituno, 
an Italian Foundation containment site, where they have undergone numerous interviews with Foundation staff. Incidentally, among them is the oldest mer person previously present in SCP-057-IT, the only one who spoke Ancient Greek fluently. He was different from the others, extremely different. In fact, he was a deity made into flesh, one of the deities replaced by the worshippers of the Great Eye. This unfortunate former god had done everything to keep his people's lives safe and peaceful, but in spite of his wisdom and best efforts, hell had once again broken loose. Not everything is all well and good in SCP-057-IT. Even if a human's body changes, their nature does not. And the worst parts of human nature seemingly followed these unfortunate merpeople into what should have been their paradise under the sea. But all hope isn't lost. If you were to judge the entire human race on one community in turmoil, you probably wouldn't leave with a very favorable impression of us either. Correspondence with a French branch of the SCP Foundation reveals that mer creatures aren't just localized to one warring underwater city in Sardinia. Mermaids have also been discovered and confirmed by Foundation field agents off the coast of France. 80% of the ocean still remains unmapped to this day. Who knows what else is out there, just waiting to be found. Water, the wellspring of life. We've dealt with a number of anomalous water sources on this channel, like SCP-006, the much sought after Fountain of Youth, or the terrifying SCP-3280, where murderous water threatens to destroy the entire world. But we've never seen anomalous water that behaves quite like this before. In many of the legends of King Arthur, the Sword of Excalibur is presented to him by the mystical Lady of the Lake. This lady emerges from the depths of the water, gifting Arthur with the enchanted sword. It's an incredible, if impossible, image. A woman appearing from within the lake, rising up from the bottom and breaking through the surface. It's safe to say that none of us have ever seen anything quite like it. Well, at least most of us haven't. In a small unnamed English village, there was a young woman who set out on a particularly lovely warm spring day to take a swim in a nearby lake. While wading in the water enjoying the sunlight and the gentle breeze on her skin, she saw a strange ripple ghost across the surface. She stopped her swimming, staring at the motion. She expected to spot a fish or some other aquatic creature. Instead, the water itself began to rise up, gathering and forming into a shape before her eyes. It was impossible, and yet here it was, happening. She pinched herself and found that she was definitely awake, as the water transformed into the shape of a human woman. It turned to look at her, shimmering eyes finding hers and liquid lips forming into a warm, inviting smile. Though this being was shocking to see, it clearly meant her no harm. It raised a translucent arm and gave her a small wave, as if to welcome her to its home. The young woman approached this lady of the lake, reaching out her own hand of flesh and bone to touch this impossible creature. Just as her fingertips reached the water woman's own, the figure dissolved back into the lake with a splash. The young woman ran home, telling anyone who would listen about the incredible thing she had seen that day. Of course, no one believed her. That is, until word of her sighting reached the only people who might take her claim seriously. The SCP Foundation. They sent operatives to the lake, where they managed to capture the shape-shifting entity dwelling there. SCP-054, also known as the Water Nymph, is a being made up entirely of water, with an average volume of 90 liters. When it is out of a body of water, the being tends to adopt the appearance of a humanoid woman, though it is capable of taking on a variety of other shapes including other humanoids, animals, and various inanimate objects. The entity is also capable of shedding its form and effectively disappearing into a given body of water. In order to avoid shrinking or possibly disappearing entirely from evaporation, SCP-054 is required to return to a larger body of water. Studies of samples taken from the entity's body, or its version of a body, reveal that it is made up of ordinary water. There is no apparent reason for its ability to move, and no thermal, electromagnetic, biological, or supernatural anomalies were detected. The research team could not determine what might make this water alive and sentient, and the nature of its unusual properties is uncertain to this day. When SCP-054 was first brought into containment at Site-08, it displayed surprisingly congenial and curious behavior. 
often walking around outside of the water and taking turns mimicking the shapes of various staff and scientists that spoke to it. Its demeanor began to shift towards suspicion and aggression, however, following a series of experiments and an incident involving the research staff. The first experiment conducted on SCP-054 sought to determine what would happen if the entity was denied access to any fresh water. Water was drained from the fountain holding it, leaving only enough water for it to form a humanoid shape, but no additional water in the basin to compensate for the effects of evaporation over time. SCP-054 became visibly frustrated as the water was being drained out of its enclosure. For the next few days, it enthusiastically greeted anyone who entered its containment facility, attempting to use a report and sense of familiarity to convince the person to provide it with more water. After it realized that this approach had no impact on the amount of water in its fountain, it became distant and even cold to anyone who attempted to speak to it. 054 only became friendly again once the water in its fountain was restored to a pre-experiment level. Next, the research team opted to test SCP-054's reaction to extreme temperatures, particularly extreme cold. The temperature of the containment facility was slowly dropped until the room fell below the freezing point of water. As the temperature dropped, 054 became sluggish and exhausted. It lost its ability to shift between forms, remaining locked in its preferred humanoid female shape. Its movement slowed more and more as the room grew colder, until the entity was completely frozen solid. Portions of the ice were chipped off and studied, revealing the crystals were identical to those of ordinary ice. After the Sub-Zero testing, the research team decided to take things to the other end of the spectrum and test the effects of heat on SCP-054. The subject was placed in a tank outfitted with heating equipment, and its temperature was slowly raised over the course of several minutes. When the water reached a temperature of 95 degrees, the entity's behavior became frenetic and aggressive. It pounded on the glass walls of the tank and attempted to break through the lid in a desperate bid for escape until the temperature was returned to a comfortable level. After the extreme temperature experiments, the previous calm and cooperative nature of SCP-054 was nowhere to be found. The subject displayed increased suspicion of the research team and would fight back whenever it was removed from its fountain and taken to a lab for experimentation. In spite of this newfound resistance, the team decided to continue their experiments as planned, hoping that the entity would return to its formerly docile self over time. Next, Dr. Seskel, the acting head of the research team, conducted a study involving SCP-054's memory and ability to be conditioned. The entity was presented with a series of increasingly complex mazes and puzzles. When it failed to comply with the experiment or solved a puzzle incorrectly, the entity was punished with an electrical shock or the release of silica gel into its body. Both of these options seemed to cause it a great deal of pain and distress, and it was eager to avoid further exposure to them. SCP-054 displayed impressive learning and problem-solving capabilities, revealing it is likely much more intelligent than it was first presumed to be. Dr. Seskel, observing the experiments and with the effectiveness of his somewhat unsavory motivational techniques, quipped to his research assistant that they would have it trained to fetch in no time. After several days of these experiments and repeated use of both the silica gel and electrical shocks, the entity's progress slowed down considerably and it became visibly exhausted. It was removed from the lab for a 48-hour rest period before experimentation was resumed yet again. This time, Dr. Seskel planned to expose SCP-054's water source to various levels of acids and bases in order to test its homeostatic capabilities, beginning with a 0.5M solution of hydrochloric acid. Prior to conducting the experiment, Dr. Seskel noted, I have no idea what will happen, but if this thing incorporates homeostatic mechanisms like I suspect, then we should get some insight into how it maintains its form. He also noted that SCP-054's behavior was becoming increasingly erratic, but made the decision to continue with the experiment as planned. SCP-054 displayed a now familiar reluctance when it was removed from its containment chamber and taken to the lab. It thrashed around in the fountain, splashing researchers with water, and retreated from them as they approached. In spite of its efforts, however, it was removed from its fountain and placed in the experimental tank. The solution of hydrochloric acid was then dripped into the tank, and then all hell broke loose. As soon as the acid touched the surface of its water, SCP-054 became incredibly distressed. It formed into the shape of a human face, eyes wide, mouth open in a silent scream of rage and pain. The water churned so aggressively that the lid of the tank was shaken loose, allowing it to escape the boundaries of its containment. 
The water formed into two large hands, which shot out of the tank and grabbed the two nearest researchers, pulling them into the water and exposing their skin to the acid now present there. As the men scrambled to drag themselves back out of the tank and their colleagues were busy helping them, SCP-054 took on its usual humanoid form and ran for the door. It then collapsed into a puddle, slipped under the crack in the bottom of the door, and made its way down the hall. It was apprehended roughly 10 minutes after its escape by a team of guards, who froze it using canisters of liquid nitrogen and then carried its icy body back to the containment facility. The two researchers who had been pulled into the tank experienced chemical burns on their skin, as well as significant mental distress. They were given immediate medical attention and placed on a leave of absence, and all experimentation on SCP-054 was suspended until further notice. At the recommendation of Dr. Seskel, 054's object class was changed to Euclid. SCP-054 is currently contained in a watertight isolation room, fitted with climate control equipment. A beautiful, intricately designed fountain has been placed in the center of the containment room, filled with fresh spring water in order to accommodate the entity's environmental needs. All maintenance workers assigned to the area must wear NBC suits while inside, and must spend 10 minutes isolated in a drying room after exiting before they are permitted to return to the rest of the facility. If 054 breaches containment, the area must be evacuated, and the containment chamber will be filled with liquid nitrogen in order to freeze its water solid. As the entity is highly sensitive to the conditions of the water that houses it, chemical levels and volume of the water in the fountain must be monitored on a regular basis, and kept at optimal levels for the health of SCP-054. During the course of its containment, following the incident around the Acid Base Incorporation experiment, 054 has developed a distrust of men, as the researchers handling that experiment were primarily male. In order to prevent future incidents and keep SCP-054 calm, no male staff are to be assigned to the team monitoring its containment unit. Because five years have passed since the last incident involving SCP-054, its object class has been changed from Euclid to SAFE, on the recommendation of the lead researcher assigned to its case. Of course, caution should still be exercised while interacting with the entity. This is the SCP Foundation, after all. And just because a moderate amount of water is good for you, doesn't mean you can't still drown. Experimentation on SCP-054 has resumed, though this time its boundaries are being honored, and it is allowed adequate time to rest and recuperate between experiments. All use of punishment in order to motivate the entity has been suspended, as it has shown itself to be more than willing to cooperate if it is treated with respect. Like all of us, it responds far better to kindness than it does to fear and intimidation. It doesn't just take on the appearance of a person, it has thoughts, feelings, and the urge to defend itself when threatened. So think twice next time you find yourself swimming in a random body of water. You should be mindful of what might be living in there. Not just of the fish, the algae, and the tiny water bugs, but of the invisible, intelligent, impossible creatures that might be swimming in there with you or even make up the very water itself. Dr. Reynard had lost everything. His job, the respect of his peers, and if everyone else was right, perhaps even his mind. It was 11 p.m. when he staggered to the edge of Okanagan Lake in British Columbia, eyes and judgment clouded with booze. This lake could have been what made his career as a researcher for the SCP Foundation, but now that bright future was slipping through his fingers like the dry silt beneath his feet. He looked hatefully across the endless dark surface of the water and loudly cursed. Stupid, empty place. Just hours ago, he'd been stripped of his ranks and released from his position at the Foundation for wasting the organization's time and resources on frivolous personal projects. Frivolous, he thought. What a terrible joke. Just because the higher-ups refused to acknowledge what was going out here didn't mean it wasn't there. Moonlight shimmered off the water's surface. Wait, was that moonlight? Or was there something lurking underneath the water? To truly answer this question, if any answer is possible at all, we need to go back to the beginning and ask ourselves a different question. How does the SCP Foundation actually find most of the anomalies it catalogs and contains? It is a simple question with a multifaceted answer, depending on the anomaly in question. For the most part, the Foundation has a network of field agents embedded in pretty much every institution across the globe, including rival groups of interest like the Global Occult Coalition and the Serpent's Hand. 
If they so much as sniff the strange and unusual, they alert the nearest site director and the necessary personnel are dispatched to the scene. There's also the Foundation web crawlers, which are a form of specialized software constantly patrolling the web for anomalous activity that the Foundation wants to know about. And one of the rarer but still incredibly important methods of finding SCPs involve looking into myths and local legends. Sure, it may seem like a good way to waste time and resources, but the crossover between recorded SCPs and folklore is surprisingly common. Take SCP-1000, the formerly hyper-intelligent apes that were nearly the dominant species on Earth until humans and a certain capricious forest god pulled the dirty trick on them. They're better known to most civilians as the legendary Bigfoot or Sasquatch, perhaps the most famous cryptid of all time. Or SCP-1337 the Hitchhiker, an anomalous spectral entity that manifests in the cars of those who don't pick her up, and performs horrific acts of violence against them. She's eerily similar to legends you can find not only all over the US, but the entire world, of ghostly hitchhikers intruding into the cars of unwary travelers and scaring them half to death. Or worse, if you're unlucky. Another case where myths and legends pointed the SCP Foundation in exactly the right direction. And of course, there's SCP-136, the terrifying naked doll. This was an almost featureless children's doll found inside an abandoned house, but prolonged time in its presence can make you the victim of a warped apparition that'll drive you half mad with fear. It's got such a detrimental psychological effect on people that the Foundation has been controversially using it as a torture method during enhanced interrogation sessions with captured members of rival groups of interest. And how did they find it? The Foundation keeps track of neighborhood rumors about haunted houses with supposedly supernatural inhabitants. Clearly, when it looks like it might actually get results, no myth or local legend is too big or too small to warrant an investigation from the SCP Foundation. It was with this mindset that a younger, happier, and less drunk Dr. B. Renard set off with his team to Okanagan Lake, in search of what locals had referred to as the legendary Ogopogo. We've all heard of the Loch Ness Monster, the lake monster from Scotland that's been turning heads for the better part of a century, and may be related to two other similar SCPs, namely SCP-3934 and SCP-5533. But Ogopogo is Canada's answer to good old Nessie. While the Loch Ness Monster resembles a pleosaur, the Ogopogo is much more serpentine, with a long, coiling body covered in green scales. Its long tail is said to be able to create fierce storms along the surface of the water with its vicious whips, killing scores of unfortunate adventurers who dared stray too close. The name Ogopogo is also a palindrome, meaning it reads the same forwards as it does backwards, and is believed to have originated in the novelty song from the year 1924. However, it's likely that the actual beast this somewhat goofy name was given to is a much older, fiercer entity. And for the sake of his reputation as a researcher, as he took a plane to the Okanagan Valley, Dr. Renard very much hoped this was the case. Of course, he'd explored the legends heavily, so much so that he was sure there had to be something to this whole thing. The Shwepmek and Silix peoples, the lake-dwelling monster was known as Naitaka, which has been loosely translated into the sacred creature of the water, the water god, and most menacing of all, the water demon. The beast was often described in oral traditions as being a malicious supernatural entity, with great power and ill intent towards those trespassing on its territory. Legend has it that anyone who crosses Okanagan Lake, the supposed domain of the Ogopogo, needs to make a sacrifice to the monster in order to ensure safe passage. Those who refused to give the sacrifice the beast demanded would pay a heavy toll, being devoured or dragged down to a watery grave, never to be seen again. And this monster isn't just some old folk tale either. Contemporary sightings have dated back to 1873, with both settlers and First Nations people alike spotting the sinister Ogopogo in the intervening years. Dr. Renard had poured through the files on hundreds of sightings. There were a number of incidents in the 1980s. So much so that the environmentalist group Greenpeace moved to have the creature classified as a protected species. Naturally, official sources decided against the idea, claiming that none of the sightings were of substance. In 1992, a vast shape filmed under the murky water in Okanagan Lake was suggested to be the legendary beast. However, the FBI stepped in to deny the validity of this case, stating that the beast was much more likely to be debris falling off a local tree 
disappointing lovers of the strange and unusual everywhere. In 2011, nearly 20 years later, there was more video footage of a sighting, showing large, dark shapes moving underneath the surface of the Okanagan Lake. However, this claim was once again dismissed by all outside parties, claiming the shape of the beast underneath the water was more likely to be a pair of logs. Bummer. 2018 was an exciting year for the Ogopogo, with three different sightings of the creature being reported at different times throughout the year. Witnesses described the creature as being a giant snake, around 50 feet long, which is consistent with a lot of the historical descriptions of the beast, as well as being over twice as long as the reticulated python, the non-anomalous longest snake in the world. So, naturally, authority figures once again shot down the validity of any claims that the creature was actually real and out there. Dr. Reynard found this almost funny. They didn't even need to suppress knowledge of this creature, if it really was out there. Mainstream sources seemed to be doing their job for them, and keeping the creature covered up. He was determined, though, that he would be the one to prove to his superiors that this creature was indeed real, and lurking in Okanagan Lake. He organized a number of varied investigative missions, from actively trawling the lake itself to conducting interviews with first-hand witnesses as well as those who claimed to see no merit in their evidence and testimony. Dr. Reynard noticed a strange phenomenon. The people who'd seen it firsthand were as certain that it was real as the doubters were that it was fake. Even for typical skeptics, the non-believers seemed shockingly resolute that there was really nothing down there and the alleged photos and videos were 100% bogus. Early diagnostic tests into the lake, directly overseen by Dr. Renard, seemed to point to a creature clearly being down there. He found the direct testimony both compelling and consistent with what he and his team were catching glimpses of. So why were people so adamant that nothing was down there? It was almost like the Ogopogo really was as mythical as the First Nations legend said, and it was casting a spell on all the non-believers. That's when it hit Dr. Renard like a perfect bolt of lightning. They weren't just looking at a particularly large sea snake with unnatural longevity here. They were looking at a sea serpent with cognitohazardous powers. It was a beast with a perfect defense mechanism. Only those who saw it up close would actually believe that the creature was real. Anyone who found out about it via secondary sources would experience an extreme state of incredulity. Nobody except those who saw it directly would ever believe that it existed and thus even the most intelligent prey would lower their defenses around its domain. An elegant and dangerous anomalous hunter, Dr. Renard had found himself a worthy opponent, and one that would help him make his mark at the Foundation. He drew up the file and gave it the designation SCP-1933 before sending it back to his supervisors. They wrote back, saying that they didn't feel as though there was enough of a basis and evidence to deem this entry worthy of inclusion. If Dr. Renard wanted to have his so-called Ogopogo dignified with entry into the SCP Foundation archives, he needed to back it up properly. This presented a problem to Dr. Renard. How could he provide documentation and evidence for a creature that had the defining anomalous power of making all of its own documentation and evidence seem phony? He was caught between a rock and a hard place, with only one solution create the most undeniably high-quality evidence of the creature that the world had ever seen. Not long after that, his superiors at the SCP Foundation would receive a video file from Dr. Renard. According to the notes on his report, he set up a track using an elk carcass to lure the creature out of the water and capture HD video of its feeding. When the senior researchers gathered around to watch the video, they were astounded. An animatronic, a cheap rubber suit around a somewhat janky robot, like something you'd see at a theme park. How much had Dr. Renard spent on this absurd farce? Did he think it was funny? Despite Dr. Renard's protests, he was reprimanded severely for this waste of Foundation resources. The object class on his 1933 file was switched to Explained, meaning a rational, non-anomalous explanation for the observed phenomenon had been found, discrediting it and the 1933 slot was instead filled with a strange fat man dressed as Santa Claus, whose bodily fluids are all Irish cream. The ultimate humiliation. Dr. Renard was left with nothing, and we join him once again where we started, with Dr. Renard standing on the ledge of Okanagan Lake, staring hatefully into the water as something seemed to move underneath. If Dr. Renard screamed that night, there was nobody there to hear it. His remains were dredged out of the lake the next day, 
His official cause of death was listed as drowning after an unfortunate boating accident, though the boat in question was never found. Reports that his corpse was found half-eaten have mostly been dismissed as rumors. After all, there is no such thing as the Ogopogo. A giant, monstrous, crab-like claw closes around the throat of an unimaginably huge, eel-like beast. The beast's terrible, writhing tentacles wrap around and latch onto the immense crustacean. And then the high-intensity beams of gamma radiation start flying. All the while, legions of skinless centaurs swim in the waters around them, relishing the violence. And in the middle, a lone boat, the SCPS Mither, manned by a team of mobile task force operatives that does all it can just to survive. There are those who consider outer space to be the ultimate achievement in exploration, the one place that explorers have yet to chart and understand. However, some of the murkiest mysteries in the universe are on our own planet, deep down at the bottom of the ocean. 95% of the deep ocean remains completely unexplored, and the little glimpses we have gotten paint a picture of something truly alien. Giant squids, organisms that can breathe nitrogen, luminescent predatory fish, and sharks as old as the Earth itself. Even the SCP Foundation is still struggling to fully grasp the depth of the ocean and the strange beings that dwell there. One of the most unusual aquatic findings in the history of the Foundation is that of SCP-3700. SCP-3700 refers to a circular area in the North Sea with a diameter of 800 kilometers. The waters there are abnormally deep for the region, with the seafloor resting at 5 kilometers beneath the ocean's surface. There are two entities present in the waters of SCP-3700, designated SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2. Interactions between these two entities are responsible for the anomalous changes to the meteorological and geological conditions in the area. SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2 always interact on the spring and fall equinoxes of any given year, but they will also engage one another throughout the year, seemingly at random. But what exactly are SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2? Aside from terrifying creatures of the deep, SCP-3700-1 is an arthropod bearing an aesthetic resemblance to the European lobster, only much, much bigger, measuring 6 kilometers in length. The creature is green, with a mix of blue, yellow, pink, and red markings across the top of its exoskeleton that bear the appearance of a woman's face. It has six prehensile limbs, four of which terminate in claws and eight legs. The entity's four eyes are compound and orange, attached to stalks. Anyone who gets close enough to observe the creature's carapace in detail will notice scars, cracks, and small holes indicating years and years of damage. SCP-3700-1 has several anomalous qualities in addition to its size. In a fight, it is able to strike with its appendages and produce cavitation bubbles with a force greater than several tons of dynamite. Two of the entity's eyes are capable of blasting concentrated gamma radiation at a chosen target. The creature has the ability to impact the weather around it, dispersing storms that impede its ability to move with ease, and can reach speeds up to 100 kilometers an hour. In spite of its immense power, SCP-3700-1 is not aggressive, and tends to ignore beings in its vicinity other than SCP-3700-2. Speaking of SCP-3700-2, it is a 32-kilometer long entity, resembling a pelican eel in all aspects except for its massive size and the 13 appendages that encircle the middle section of its body. These appendages, which tuck inside its body when not in use, are similar to the tentacles of an octopus, complete with suckers. The majority of the entity's body consists of a sinewy tail, terminating in a sharp point. When its mouth is open, it is an estimated 3 kilometers deep. Its flesh is black, and it has white, purple, and red bioluminescent lines in the shape of a man's face on either side of its torso. 
SCP-3700-2 is anomalous properties include the ability to invoke storms with the severity of Category 5 hurricanes and the ability to produce whirlpools that draw in any vessel within 150 meters so that it can rip them apart. It is also able to produce high-energy sound waves as well as blue fire, which it emits from its esophagus. When the two entities interact, it results in an epic struggle as each begins attempts to destroy or subdue the other. When one is victorious, immediate changes to the area follow. When SCP-3700-1 wins, the storms and harsh weather in the area will immediately calm, and an era of fertility and abundance will begin. The reproductive rates of fauna in the ocean and on the islands nearby increase threefold, and the crop yield doubles. The ocean itself becomes increasingly active, and the erosion rates of the archipelago's shores increase fivefold. When SCP-3700-2 wins, however, the weather conditions become dangerous. With raging hurricanes, rapidly fluctuating temperatures, and constantly changing storm fronts that cause destruction of buildings and loss of life. Naturally, this renders any ocean travel in the area extremely difficult or even impossible. Aquatic food sources are driven away by harsh conditions, and livestock are killed by exposure and disease. Crops are unable to thrive in the high winds, waterlogged soil, and lack of sunlight. All the while, SCP-3700-2 swims throughout the area, preying on unsuspecting ships and menacing the coastline, until SCP-3700-1 manifests to challenge it again. SCP-3700-2 will also regurgitate instances of SCP-3456, though how or why this is possible is unknown. For those unfamiliar with SCP-3456, they are a group of hairless, three-toed, horse-like creatures with thick, translucent skin and human torsos fused to their backs. They are most frequently seen near sites of war, terrorist attacks, and devastating natural disasters. Direct observation of one of these entities will draw their attention to the observer, who the entity will then stalk and capture before disappearing. Due to their enormous size and ability to anomalously manifest in their home waters, SCP-3700-1 and 2 cannot be contained at a Foundation site. Instead, their containment is handled by Foundation Naval Task Force Delta-7, Northern Storm, who patrol the area in combination of refurbished battleships, destroyers, cruisers, and support craft. Additionally, measures have been taken to suppress information about SCP-3700 among the general population. Details about the unusual depth of the waters there have been stricken from public texts and scientific publications. SCP-3700-1 has been implanted with Donovian hollow projectors, which disguise it as a pod of humpback whales. If SCP-3700-1 encounters SCP-3700-2, Delta-7 may engage protocol Winter Maelstrom. This consists of destroyers deploying harpoon-based anchors into SCP-3700-2's head to hold it in one location. Next, the vessels work together to target the entity until SCP-3700-1 is able to subdue it. If this does not prove effective and SCP-3700-2 cannot be contained, then the task force will implement Protocol Tumult. At this point, naval and civilian crafts in the area must be evacuated. Trade and ferry routes to the archipelagos must be rerouted for at least six months. There will be constant aerial and naval engagement with SCP-3700-2, and constant monitoring for the reappearance of SCP-3700-1. The behavior of SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2 is largely very predictable, with one notable exception. On March 20th, 2017, a pair of SCP Foundation-owned battleships known as the Mither and the Terran arrived at a point between the Orkney, Shetland, and Faroe Archipelagos in the North Sea. They were accompanied by the usual fleet of Delta-7 ships. Approximately 600 meters away from the ship's anchor points, the water began to emit intense, bright rays of light for a duration of three minutes. At this point, SCP-3700-1 appeared, visible through the surface of the water. Delta-7 withdrew their anchors, speeding toward the entity. As the ships caught up to the entity, it raised two of its claws into the air, 
clicking them together in a friendly greeting. The Delta Seven ships followed the entity along its usual swimming path for 30 minutes, and during this time, all was peaceful. But this peace did not endure for long. The tide began to change, literally. As large black wall clouds formed overhead, the winds picked up, and the waves churned violently. In response, SCP-3700-1 raised its claws overhead, waving them in a circular motion, and parting the clouds above it and Delta-7. But this effort took a lot out of the creature, and after 30 seconds, its antenna began to droop, and it lowered its claws. Still, the hole in the clouds remained, allowing a spot of sunshine to break through and beam down on the Foundation vessels. 600 meters ahead, the ocean waters began to rage and froth, spraying foam and surf into the air. SCP-3700-2 burst from beneath the surface, its head pointed upward. It continued to rise until the tops of its tentacles could be seen just above the water, then stopped to bend its torso and turn its head horizontally, its jaw unhinged, exposing rows upon rows of serrated teeth. The beast let out a mighty roar, accompanied by a stream of blue flame. At the sight of its rival, SCP-3700-1 dove beneath the surface, disappearing from view. The SCPS Mither ordered the rest of the vessels to engage Protocol Winter Maelstrom. Delta-7 scattered out from SCP-3700-1's point of submersion, and all 13 destroyers fired their harpoons at SCP-3700-2, embedding themselves in the entity's head. Naturally, this enraged the creature, and it began to roar and wail spinning its lower body vigorously enough to generate a whirlpool. The cruisers opened fire with a combination of L cannons and conventional weaponry in order to distract the entity as the destroyers pulled their harpoon lines taut, dragging its head in a continuous circle. While this was taking place, the battleships got into position and prepared to fire on the Mither's mark. Three, two, one, fire! The first broadside barrage collided with SCP-3700-2, and it grunted in pain, thrashing back and forth before opening its mouth and spewing an instance of SCP-3456 into the water. As soon as it hit the water, the equine monster began to cut through at a pace of 50 kilometers an hour, making its way toward the destroyers, particularly the SCPS Selkie. The Selkie attempted to retarget its weapons and prevent the creature from reaching it but the monster moved too quickly for the Selkie to adjust. The Selkie was lifted out of the water by the creature as crew members desperately clung to the railings and their weaponry. As the crew cowered and tried to fend off the creature, it reached for them, trying to pull them from the ship. While the Selkie was occupied, SCP-3700-2 was able to attack again, blasting another ship with a stream of blue fire. A loud crack rang out from across the sea as the Selkie dropped back into the water, the SCP-3456 instance shrieking in pain. SCP-3700-1 burst through the surface, striking the creature with its club-like limbs, each blow emitting another loud crack. The third blow tore the instance in half, sending its human torso careening through the air and past the SCPS Mither. Freed from its attack, the Selkie moved full steam ahead, pulling the harpoon line taut again and dragging SCP-3700-2 out of its path. Several Silky crew members were thrown overboard during the struggle, and as they struggled to keep their heads above water, SCP-3700-1 scooped them up, placing them onto the deck of a nearby destroyer and out of harm's way. With the crew members rescued, SCP-3700-1 set its sights on its enemy, swimming towards the edge of the whirlpool and emitting a luminescent glow from two of its eyes. The constant barrage of cannon fire on SCP-3700-2 was beginning to take its toll, and the Mither ordered the fleet to, quote, brace for the killing blow. As if responding to the Mither's call, SCP-3700-1 shot several concentrated blasts of gamma radiation at its foe, leaving large holes in the creature in their wake. SCP-3700-2 screamed, flailing so hard that it snapped the harpoon lines and created waves large enough to push the vessels backward. With its newfound freedom, SCP-3700-2 impaled SCP-3700-1 through the midsection with its barbed tip of its tail, lifting it up and out of the water with the force of the blow. SCP-3700-1 desperately tried to free itself, 
attacking the tail with its club-like limbs, but the fight was in vain, and after a moment, all movement stopped. SCP-3700-1 was, for at least the duration of this manifestation, dead. SCP-3700-2 tossed the corpse into the water, flinging it past Delta-7 where it crashed into the water and sank down into the depths below. At this point, Delta-7 was ordered to initiate Protocol Tumult. The Delta-7 vessels turned away from SCP-3700-2 and prepared to evacuate the area. One of the ships, the SCP-S Strosony Beast, slowed behind the rest of the fleet, emitting concerning amounts of smoke before coming to a stop. Meanwhile, the enraged and emboldened SCP-3700-2 expanded the size of its whirlpool, setting its sights on the retreating ships and the weakened Strosony Beast. The ship tried to flee, but the engines were completely shot and would not respond. The ship was caught in the whirlpool and pulled against its will toward SCP-3700-2. As the crew looked on in helpless dread, a tentacle rose from the deep, wrapping around the vessel and dragging it toward the entity's gaping maw. Suddenly, SCP-3700-1 exploded from beneath the surface of the water, leaping between the ship and SCP-3700-2, cutting the tentacle in half and freeing the Strosony Beast from its grip. SCP-3700-2 shrieked before closing its jaws and biting down on SCP-3700-1. It retaliated, emitting bright flashes of light and doing enough damage to stop SCP-3700-2 from continuing to produce its whirlpool. Another tentacle emerged from the water, pulling at SCP-3700-1's legs and ripping them from its body. But SCP-3700-1 returned the assault in kind, bludgeoning SCP-3700-2 with its club-like limbs from inside of its mouth. All at once, SCP-3700-2's lower jaw was torn out of place, dropping into the water with SCP-3700-1 still inside. SCP-3700-2 thrashed futilely, growing steadily weaker and weaker. It released one more stream of fire before collapsing. Delta-7 paused the retreat, watching the scene for any sign of a winner, but after five minutes, neither entity had moved. Delta-7 returned to the site of the battle to investigate, and saw that neither entity was moving, and both appeared to be deceased. Shortly after Delta-7 reached the area, both entities disappeared, leaving a single, round, unidentified object that sank below the surface where SCP-3700-1 had just been. The wall clouds overhead dispersed, leaving standard cumulonimbus clouds in their place. The waters themselves remained choppy. Unsure of how to proceed, the SEPS Mither sent a radio transmission to command. Ah, uh, this is Delta-7 to command. We read you, Delta-7, command replied. We have a bit of a situation. Go ahead, Delta-7. SCP-3700-1 and 2 are both down. Command was silent for 10 seconds, utterly baffled by the information. Please repeat, Delta-7. Again, the Mither said, SCP-3700-1 and 2 are both down. Command ordered the Mither to stand by. Three minutes of radio silence later, communication resumed as they asked, Are either entity's effects active? Ah, uh, negative, Command. Is there any trace of either entity? Also negative. It appears the anomaly has been neutralized. Delta-7 is to return to base for debrief following any recovery efforts. With their next steps clear, Delta-7 attached the Strosny Vs to several tugboats, preparing to pull the vessel to safety. But there was one more surprise waiting. The SCPS Mither began picking up unusual levels of gamma radiation, as well as a sonar contact at a depth of 3 kilometers. They called command, requesting permission to deploy submersibles for exploration purposes. One minute of silence followed, as the command arrived at a decision. Request denied. Return to base for debriefing. And so, Delta-7 began to evacuate the area once more, steaming in the opposite direction of the battle. Over the next five minutes, CCTV cameras on the vessels picked up an unusual sight. As the gamma radiation levels continued to increase, the ocean turbulence also worsened, tossing smaller vessels and nearly causing them to capsize. Then, all of a sudden, the water stilled, and four large yellow orbs appeared below the surface, approximately 300 meters from Delta-7. They lingered there for two minutes before vanishing. Afterward, a new sonar contact was detected, five kilometers deep, 
directly beneath the task force. Command, we've lost the signal from the previous contact and are no longer detecting gamma radiation. Uh, we're, we're detecting new contact five kilometers deep, large and metallic. After further deliberation, command responded. Delta-7, you are authorized to deploy submersibles for exploration purposes. Be advised, should SCP-3700-2 manifest, exploration teams are to be considered lost, and you are to return to base. The consequences of this incident, as well as what else might be lurking down in the depths beneath SCP-3700, are still unknown. The ocean is a terrifying place. We've all heard the statistics. More than 80% of the ocean remains unexplored. That's most of the water covering the globe, completely unmapped and unobserved by science. It's a scary thought to dwell on, realizing that there's more water than land on Earth, and the sheer expanse of that water is so large that we've been unable to fully explore all of it. Just think, there are places in the ocean that have never been seen by a human. Who knows what's down there? If there was ever a personification of fear of the unknown, the ocean could definitely be it. Ancient shipwrecks sunk to the ocean floor, unknown sea creatures hiding away from humanity, and the general isolation of the suffocating dark blue the ocean swallows its victims with. All of these images that come to mind when thinking about the vast and mysterious depths of the sea. And no one is more familiar with nautical mysteries than the SCP Foundation. Today, we'll be taking a look at SCP-5007, the Bass Strait, a wave of oceanic anomalies fit to make any seasoned sailor shiver in fear. The Bass Strait is an area of ocean dividing Tasmania and the Australian mainland. It's also the location of an unusually high amount of disappearances, sailors disappearing from their ships, fishermen leaving in the night and never coming back, even civilians disappearing from the shores that connect to the strait. The Foundation was aware of these disappearances since 1858, but were only able to craft theories about what was causing them. Was it an anomalous group of interest? Hostile aerial entities patrolling the skies above the strait? Phenomenon associated with unidentified flying objects? What about subterranean anomalies, weather patterns, or time dilation? For nearly a century, the Foundation was unable to determine the cause of the high number of disappearances in the Bass Strait. And then, the phenomenon suddenly revealed itself. In 1980, on a beach connected to the Strait, Agent Taberner, an operative of the SCP Foundation, was vacationing with his wife Mary and his three young children. The Taberner family was simply enjoying their day, when they saw what looked like balloons in the sky. They were approaching quickly, and naturally the family moved closer. What happened next was a whirlwind, and those balloons the family were so interested in lifted them up from the ground and carried them away. Agent Taberner tried to fight back, but there was nothing he could do, except report to the Foundation what had occurred, and the organization responded in full force. The Foundation's research discovered that reports of UFOs and lights in the sky had coincided with many disappearances in the strait, and that this was a pattern. The search for the four lost Taberner family members had become a large-scale investigation into unexplained disappearances along the Bass Strait, and within three weeks, it was determined that these patterns were consistent across the entirety of the strait's coastal regions. Some witnesses were interviewed, but the vast majority of these abduction cases had no witnesses whatsoever. Of the minimal reports filed, the Foundation was told that there were lights in the sky, and that appearance of unidentified flying objects described as having the appearances of balloons. One such witness interviewed was a man by the name of Alan Stewart, a witness who was present during the disappearance of former Australian Prime Minister Harold Holt, whose disappearance the Foundation believed may have had a connection to the Bass Strait anomalies. During the interview, Stewart claimed that Holt and his family, while voyaging on their yacht, decided to leave the boat and go for a swim. Holt turned to Stewart and asked him if he could see the balloons around the cliff. Stewart had no idea what Holt was talking about, but Holt was insistent on seeing them. He swam deeper out into the ocean, saying that they weren't normal balloons and that there was someone inside of them. Stewart and Holt's family called out for him to come to shore, but he wouldn't listen. Stewart tried to rationalize what he saw next. Maybe it was the current sweeping Holt away, but he couldn't lie to the Foundation interviewer. Mm -hmm. Stewart saw Holt go further and further out into the water, and suddenly the Prime Minister turned around. He began swimming in the opposite direction, and he was screaming. Suddenly, 
Holt was lifted from the sea and pulled into the air by something emerging from the clouds. The Foundation thanked Stewart for the interview and continued their investigation. Two years later, in 1982, emergency services received a large number of calls pertaining to UFO sightings off the coast of Norman Bay, Victoria. The Foundation was quick to respond, alerting task forces and local sites to prepare for an investigation. Upon arriving to the scene, they confirmed the existence of multiple entities that would later be documented as SCP-5007. They evacuated civilians from the area and successfully managed to capture the creature, which was later transported to Site-40 for containment. It was a sight to behold. The entity, now designated SCP-5007-S1, was a cluster of human bodies fused between a grouping of black tentacles of varying length. Each tentacle was fused to the skin it touched directly. The stomachs of the corpses were grossly swollen and distorted to massive sizes to hold large quantities of gases inside, the buoyancy of which the entity used to achieve a passive flight. Across the entity's surface were clusters of eyes and bioluminescent glowing organs. Many of the humanoid components of the corpses appeared to have been removed and misplaced across various parts of the entity's body. What's more is that the Foundation discovered that human portions of SCP-5007 appeared somewhat cognizant and aware of their situation. Their vocalizations were incoherent and barely understandable, consisting of gasping and whimpering, but the corpses were observed to implore other individuals to approach them when encountered. SCP-5007's behavior during abduction scenarios was documented during the initial containment event, and due to the Foundation's painstaking research, a pattern was established between all SCP-5007 encounters. First, the victim would be alone, or otherwise vulnerable, in a coastal location. SCP-5007 haven't shown a preference for weather, be they clear or hostile skies, but they have localized all of their activity to the Bass Strait, in small coastal towns, beaches, or boats. SCP-5007 will then move towards the shore, stalking the victim before lowering its tentacles and appendages to grab the individual, snatching them into the sky. An SCP-5007 instance can even abduct multiple people at once. One event observed had eight men from the decks of a commercial fishing boat taken into the sky in under 15 seconds. Once captured, SCP-5007 instances will dart across the water at a high speed and take their victims to an unknown location. Discovering where SCP-5007 took their victims became a top priority for the Foundation. After extensive witness interviews and compiling a database of likely victims, they determined that there must be at least 16 instances of SCP-5007 unaccounted for. Personnel kept a close watch on the coastlines and waters of the Bass Strait, and equipped various marine task forces with research vessels capable of tracking any instances if they encountered them. In 1985, the Foundation's research efforts paid off, and several survey teams operating in the area reported the sighting of an extremely large SCP-5007 instance heading towards a coastal town. A mobile task force was sent to track the entity. The team observed the entity from afar as it stalked a private fishing boat. Even from the distance, Foundation personnel recognized the likenesses of several missing persons as faces of the corpses of SCP-5007. The task force captain had to remind his team to keep it together, claiming that they were not people, but just parts of the specimen. But everyone secretly knew the truth. The fishing vessel was a private one, occupied by a small family. The entity slowly approached and quickly pulled a woman into the air. The family panicked and quickly tried to reach cover for safety, running into the ship's cabin. The entity ran its tentacles along the boat until it pulled the door open, snatching another two victims. The task force was unable to help them, as their mission was to track the instance to its origin point. It was a horror to watch. The task force implanted a tracking beacon onto the entity and quietly followed it out to sea over the next four hours. They then discovered a large gray reef with several shipwrecks dotted across it. Thirteen SCP-5007 instances floated over the area, some holding on to the land reef with their tentacles. The entity dropped the abductees from the fishing boat, who were coerced by the entities into diving into a massive pool of water located in the center of the reef. One by one, each abductee was pulled below the surface by something lurking in the pool. 
all while the SCP-5007 instances watched. Disgusted, the task force reported what they observed to the main site, and the reef would be designated as SCP-5007-A. The Foundation's analysis of the reef led to the discovery that the rock covering it seeped iron oxide from an unknown source, and the rocks achieved growth at an anomalously fast rate, often as little as 40 minutes. All of the wrecked ships and aircraft that washed across the shore of the reef were covered with a dark stone. The reef was teeming with anomalous marine life, including SCP-5007, a red algae that fed upon the freshly grown rock, marine worms capable of levitation, spiders that lived in silk retreats underneath the waterline, small fish, and giant organisms resembling large clumps of kelp, which the Foundation had previously documented as SCP-4159 in a separate investigation. SCP-5007 often rested their tentacles on the outcroppings of the reef while inactive, but what caught the Foundation's attention the most was the giant pit located in the reef center. Unmanned exploration drones found that it had a depth of at least 4,000 meters, and water samples taken from the pit revealed large quantities of human DNA, prehistoric bacteria, and unknown compounds that possess significant life-preserving qualities. When a being was submerged in the compound, they were able to survive heavy injuries, even when fully surrounded by the liquid and unable to breathe. The Foundation's exploration of one of these shipwrecks led them to a journal. Most of it was illegible due to water damage, but one passage survived, located in the back of the book. It detailed the experience of an unknown crew member of the ship caught in a storm. It reads, Morsby spied land ahead, and the boys said that there are giant balloons hanging over the island. We are all afeard, but there is naught we can do but beach ourselves and help for rescue. Should I be killed in the crash, I want my mates to give this journal to my Mary. Might know I spent my last thinking only of her. The interior of the ship contained human remains inside, but there were less skeletons than the Foundation would expect for a ship of its size. The location of the rest of the bodies was unknown. Another event related to SCP-5007 the Foundation documented involved Frederick Valentich, a pilot engaged in a training flight over the Bass Strait in 1978. Valentich's disappearance was marked by his latest communication with air traffic control, when he mistook an SCP-5007 instance for an unidentified aircraft. It seems like it's stationary. What I'm doing right now is orbiting, and the thing is just orbiting on top of me. Also, it's got a green light and sort of metallic like it's all shiny on the outside. Shortly after this, Valentich's transmission was interrupted by what was described as metallic scraping sounds, believed to be the SCP-5007 instance attacking the aircraft and jamming its propellers with its mass. After crashing into the reef, it was believed that Valentich and his aircraft were pulled beneath the surface of the pit, just as the abductees had been prior. The Foundation decided to construct a provisional secure research facility on the reef. They named it Site-40-R and documented all returns and departures of SCP-5007. They also set up a series of containment procedures that resulted in SCP-5007 returning with its victims 83% less often than before the site's construction, but this was short-lived. In 2008, the site logged over 36 instances returning to the reef, with only two not having any fresh abductees. The instances' origins were unknown, and it was as if they appeared out of thin air. No other monitoring post had documented their appearance, or even spotted them before they arrived at the reef. It was years later in 2017 that the Foundation eventually was able to successfully explore what was deep inside the pit at the center of the reef. They already knew that there was a large entity lurking beneath, as evidenced by what happened to the victims of SCP-5007 that were later deposited inside the pool. All previous attempts to explore the pool were met with failure, as the water pressure of the pit's depths caused all craft to collapse due to hull damage. This time, however, they managed to construct a high-tech submarine, labeled the SCPS Nautilus, which was capable of diving a maximum of 13,500 meters underwater. They decided that a D-Class personnel would be trained to man the submersible and carry out the exploration. The mission was simple. The Nautilus was to dive to the bottom of the pit and to describe the depth readings. Cameras and microphones were equipped to the vessel. Due to the depth, remote viewing of the footage was impossible. Instead, the Foundation had to physically recollect the vessel in order to view the footage. Upon recovery, some of the footage suffered data corruption, but what was there shook those who viewed it to their core. The footage showed the D-Class's experience going deeper inside the pit. 
At first, it seemed ordinary. The trench had a number of rocky outcroppings dotted with black-yellow vines growing along the walls. Also present were various marine life forms, such as the spiders or the fish. Going deeper, the sub observed an SCP-5007 instance clinging to an outcropping. Several tendrils emerging from the pit's depths were wrapped around the instance and holding on to the entity, as if it were feeding from it. Another 16 SCP-5007 instances were seen resting along the walls, each clinging to the outcropping. As the sub went deeper, the D-Class remarked that there were dozens of plane and shipwrecks, but also well over a hundred SCP-5007 entities. Most of them were held there by the Black Tendrils. The D-Class, as the sub went even deeper, began noticing human remains. No short amount of them, either. Deep into the pit, there was a large mass of human remains covering the entirety of the pit. Bodies crushed and drained of blood, but still possessing intact eyes. Each individual was still alive, kept preserved by the life-sustaining compounds found within the water. The body stared at the sub and moved, attempting to grab onto the vehicle. The D-Class swore they were trying to say something, mouthing words to the camera of the sub. As the sub passed through the mass of bodies, it emerged into a completely dark, black clearing at the bottom of the pit. For a second, the D-Class thought he was safe. But then, a large black tentacle rapidly emerged from below and grabbed onto the Nautilus, dragging it even further into the depths. The D-Class screamed and panicked, but there was nothing he could do. The tentacle possessed a large cluster of eyes, mouths, and human heads seemingly grafted onto its mass. And then there was another tentacle, and then another. The Nautilus was pulled to the bottom of the pool. The D-Class's screams were still heard even as the picture cut out. Sometimes graphic body-altering images of the tentacle's features were visible on the screen, but most of the footage was indecipherable. After minutes of distorted, corrupted footage, the Nautilus was seen again, rapidly ascending to the surface. Somehow, it had managed to escape the entity at the bottom of the pit. Upon recovery of the craft, it was found that the Nautilus was covered in a thick, organic coating similar to a black slime mold, but with dozens of eyes growing from it. The D-Class inside showed severe psychological damage and attempted to harm Foundation personnel. They were terminated shortly after due to being a danger to those around them. Following review of the footage, the Nautilus was to be dismantled and incinerated, along with the remains of the D-Class. A reinforced containment seal was fitted over the pit, with the intention of keeping whatever was down there isolated from the surface. But this was short-lived. After the containment seal was fitted, Site-40 underwent a massive communications blackout. Every device on site received an email containing a single image of a large eye taken from a security camera. The text beneath it simply read, Found you. Some personnel who viewed the email underwent anomalous changes, growing new physical features such as eyes and other various growths across their body. The entirety of Site-40-R went offline, and the Foundation could not establish contact. In an emergency effort to do so, Mobile Task Force Gamma-6 Deep Feeders was sent to investigate. The Task Force's assault on Site-40-R was a daring effort, as the majority of the site was completely overtaken by tentacles, growths, and anomalous alterations. While numerous altered personnel were lost due to the mission, it was ultimately a success. Some altered personnel were able to be saved through extensive surgery to remove their anomalous growths. And after everything was said and done, the site was repaired and reconstructed without incident. Following the site's repair, there has been little activity from the entity within the pit, but the Foundation continued to keep an eye on the creature and the ecosystem of the anomalous marine life that live on the Bass Strait, never knowing what their next move might be, and always keeping in mind the risk that comes with dealing with these poorly understood entities. The diver screams a silent scream as the giant squid's beak digs into his skin, its many grasping tentacles grabbing him and holding him in place. Nearby, his fellow divers are driven half-mad with terror as they see mysterious figures floating towards them through the murk, and strange Russian voices speaking in their heads. Nobody can help them. They're down too deep, too consumed by the darkness and the pressure of the sea. They're now at the mercy of whatever is inside the submarine. Beginning in the 1940s, with the dawn of nuclear weapons, the American government conducting the world's first atomic weapons test and the Soviet Union responding in kind with nuclear testing of their own, 
The two powers entered an arms race fueled by rivalry and a thirst to prove their strength on the world stage. What followed were decades of staggering technological advancements as each nation tried to outdo and intimidate the other. The Soviet Union crossed into the cold reaches of outer space, deploying the satellite Sputnik. The United States responded with the founding of NASA. Tensions reached a fever pitch during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, as United States citizens feared they were teetering on the brink of nuclear war. In July of 1968, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and the United States came together to sign the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, agreeing to abandon their pursuit of increasing nuclear power and turn their focus to disarmament. But several months before the treaty was signed, the Soviet government was dealing in weaponry far more dangerous than nuclear missiles, something the other world powers knew nothing about. These deadly secrets were hidden aboard a submarine known as SCP-741. SCP-741 is the underwater wreckage of a Soviet submarine that sank in March of 1968 and came into the custody of the SCP Foundation in 1999. The submarine, a version of the Charlie II class, was deployed under unusual circumstances, which attracted the attention of the United States government. In an attempt to learn more about the submarine, the US government launched Project Redacted, which attempted to recover the vessel from the ocean in the early 1970s. They managed to recover a few pieces of the vessel, though the specifics are highly classified. In the late 1990s, the US government contacted the SCP Foundation, informing them of a possible Euclid or Keter-class anomaly in the wreck. At this point, it passed into the custody and surveillance of the Foundation. The submarine is on the ocean floor, broken into three pieces. The hull was broken into bits during Project Redacted recovery attempt, but was largely intact when it first sank except for two holes, one just in front of the sail and one just below the starboard missile tubes. Apparently, the vessel sank rapidly due to flooding after an enemy missile strike, which occurred while it was surfacing. Though all parts of the submarine are accounted for, no members of the crew have been located. Additionally, none of the emergency escape equipment on board has been used, raising further questions about what became of the crew. Wherever they went, they seem to have left something behind. Whenever divers are sent down to investigate the wreckage, they report experiencing anomalous currents and strange sea life, and hearing moans, disembodied voices, and incoherent whispering. They also report seeing blurry, faintly glowing figures. Additionally, the ocean life in the area is unnaturally aggressive, particularly large squid and sharks. This effect was first noted during a manned expedition into the waters around the wreckage, described in Incident Report 1741-A. Divers A26 through A30 embarked from the icebreaker Yamal into the waters below with the intention of studying the potential anomalous activity surrounding the wreckage. As the group of divers approached the submarine, they could feel the shift in the water around them. The oppressive feeling of abnormally increasing pressure bearing down and threatening to crush them. If their specialized diving equipment were to fail, they knew that that would be it, and the command would have to come and fish their corpses out of the water. Or even worse, they would vanish entirely, meeting the same mysterious fate as the crew of that doomed submarine. But they couldn't fixate on that. They had a job to do. At first glance, the wreckage appeared undisturbed, unchanged since the previous inspection. Still, they needed to take a closer look to be sure. As the team got closer to the vessel, A-30 was startled by the sight of movement from within the wreckage, spotting motion through one of the holes in the structure as something passed by. He pointed it out to his colleagues, but they dismissed it as likely a giant isopod or spider crab, which were crawling all over the surrounding area. A-30 laughed off his jumpiness, agreed that they were probably right, and continued the exploration as planned. Control authorized the divers to proceed to the next step and A-29 activated sonar and lights, moving toward the starboard side breach. There, a faint glowing caught his eye. The glow resembled that of radioactive material, but when the team checked the radiation levels in the area, they remained stable. Whatever the source of the glow was, it wasn't radioactive. At this point, his neutron counter began to register something, and all of a sudden, a disembodied voice could be heard saying, Vasily Yevgeny, can you hear me? The voice was muffled, and though it could be heard over their communication channels, it emanated from somewhere in the wreckage. 
deep, deep underwater. As A29 watched, a glowing shape emerged from the darkness. It was only an outline, the suggestion of a silhouette, but the shape was undeniably familiar. It looked like a person. The other divers quickly noted the apparition too and began to panic. Some checked their nitrogen levels, believing it to be some sort of nitrogen narcosis, while others pointed out that they couldn't all be suffering from nitrogen narcosis at the same time. The unknown voice continued speaking, saying, Help me, it is getting hard to breathe. The divers debated what to do next, questioning whether what they were seeing was even real, when all at once, the humanoid figure vanished from sight. The divers attempted to shake off the startling encounter, and they resumed their duties, the investigation proceeding as normal. After a few moments of uneventful work, another interruption presented itself in the form of a five-meter-long squid swimming around the wreckage. Its presence startled the divers at first, particularly those closest to the animal, but the others encouraged them to ignore it, citing the fact that there are no records of these squid attacking humans. So they did, continuing their work as the squid circled them with apparent curiosity. A27 spotted an unusual shell below the wreckage, notably large and difficult to identify, and Control requested that they bring it up to the surface for further inspection by a marine biologist. The diver began attaching haul cables to the shell as the squid crept closer and closer. All of a sudden, A26 screamed, and there was a sudden bloom of blood in the water. The squid, despite it being uncharacteristic behavior for its species, attacked the diver, biting him savagely. Prompted by cries for help from the diving team, Control began to reel A26 back towards the surface, proceeding slowly to give him decompression time, and the squid took advantage of the slow retreat. It chased after the diver, grabbing hold of him and biting down again, tearing away at him as it gripped him in its tentacles. Still, Control continued reeling him in, hoping to free him from the squid's grasp as they yanked him to the surface. The other divers were ordered to get themselves out of there as fast as possible, an order they gladly obeyed. As they swam back to the surface, A30 saw something else moving in the depths. He couldn't make out what it was, but the sight of it gave him a sick feeling of dread deep in the pit of his stomach. The four divers were recovered alive, along with the shell. Examination of the shell indicated that it resembled that of the extinct orthoconic nautiloids, but it was not fossilized. It was taken for further study, given the possible implication of extinct species anomalously manifesting in the vicinity of SCP-714. Diver A26 lost a limb and was exposed to an unknown venom via bites from the attacking squid. His camera was destroyed in the process. As squid are not known to attack humans unprovoked, this behavior has been attributed to the influence of SCP-741, though the exact link between the two is yet to be determined. An anomalous pressure gradient surrounds the wreck with a radius of approximately 250 meters, starting around the center of the submarine. The pressure in this area is much greater than it should be, given the depth of the waters there. This unusually high pressure makes sonar analysis extremely difficult, as well as threatening the safety of any divers in the vicinity of the wreck. The few records that the Foundation has managed to obtain from the Russian and U.S. governments indicate that the submarine was being used to transport some sort of secret cargo. Though the specifics of this cargo are still unknown, there is reason to believe that it differed from any type of nuclear or chemical weaponry. On a date redacted from official files, the SCPS Basisti was patrolling the area around SCP-741 when its sonar detected some unknown entity approaching SCP-741 from the south at a pace of 46 knots. The crew compared the acoustic signature of the contact with known submarines and torpedoes, but could not find a match. The Basisti attempted to reach the contact via sonar buoy drops and active sonar pings, but it did not respond. When the contact crossed into the total underwater exclusion zone, it became classified as hostile. At that point, the sonar recorded sounds of an undersea missile launch, and Basisti responded with the utmost urgency. The ship broke away from its original area and fired a Type 53 torpedo at the underwater threat. Fifteen seconds after the Basisti launched its torpedo, missiles of an unidentified configuration were seen breaking the water, flying at a height of 1.8 meters and a velocity of 0.92 Mach. The missiles did not emit any detectable radar, nor did they respond to any launch chaff or flares from the Basisti. 
Both of the missiles were engaged by Basisti's 3KN-5 Kinsol surface-to-air missiles and Kashtan point defense systems, and were destroyed at 1,800 meters and 210 meters from impact, respectively. After the missiles were neutralized, the hostile vessel could be heard engaging in evasive maneuvers. At this point, there were four closely spaced explosions and the sound of a submarine disintegrating. The identity of the attacker, as well as its intention toward SCP-741, have not yet been determined. The incident resulted in the Foundation research team suggesting an expansion of the acoustic sensor net, as well as additional patrol and defense assets placed in the area. Additionally, they advised an acquisition of undersea retaliatory capability. The incident was classified Incident 1741-C. The sonar recordings from the SCPS Basisti during Incident 1741-C were taken for further analysis by the research team. The in-depth review revealed anomalous acoustic signatures that did not match up with any known forms of propulsion, including magneto-hydrodynamic drive. Currently, the nature of the unidentified attacker remains a mystery, and it has not been attributed to any particular government or organization. Following the incident involving the SCPS Basisti, an American intelligence agent reached out to the Foundation, offering further insight into the secretive government programs looking into SCP-741. He agreed to sit for an interview with a Foundation researcher assigned to the project, on the condition that his identity remain protected. The SCP researcher's name is absent from the official file as well. The two men sat in a Foundation interview room, and the interviewer asked his informant why he chose to come forward, given the U.S. government had simply chosen to sit on this information for 30 years. You've seen those reports. Project Redacted. Now we know that part too. How the directors didn't make the connection is beyond me. That and the stuff the Redacted pulled up? Yeah, the other part you don't hear about is what some of the research team died of. And the crewmen we buried? Just uniforms. Also, the nuclear device we recovered wasn't a missile or torpedo warhead. It was a demolition charge. Does that make any sense? After all those clues, I had to come forward. Why the director and didn't is something I can't fully explain. This particular statement puzzled the Foundation researcher, raising questions he hadn't anticipated. Only uniforms? Did this mean that the sub had been unmanned? The informant replied, no, no, not unmanned. There were no bodies, but personal effects were everywhere, along with uniforms. There was some blood, human. Before you ask, on one of the torpedoes and a bit of skin where somebody probably crushed his hand loading the thing, just no bodies left. When I first looked into all this, I had no clue what the hell had gone on down there, but I started putting things together. The Foundation agent began to speculate based on the mounting evidence. Could it have been a Soviet weapons program? A deadly biological agent of some kind. No, no, it wasn't that. I thought maybe it could have been, so I dialed up some of my contacts at BioPreparent. Our spies wind up owing each other favors after a while, and they denied it vehemently. Not your usual cover-up baloney either. They clearly stated that whatever the sub was carrying, it wasn't theirs. They wanted no part of it. Sound like he was gonna puke when I mentioned redacted. Doctor, do you have any idea what it takes to make a bioweapons researcher sick? Now that wasn't what really bugged me though. What really kept me awake at night was the KGB file that fell into our hands. They mentioned a covert op by the Soviet military against an internal unnamed faction to get rid of a quote, terrifying weapons that even the Soviet Union can't safely control. They wanted to lose it, whatever it was, or maybe fob it off onto the US. Of course, that all came to light right before the Iron Curtain fell. And given the atmosphere at the time, it was practically impossible to convince the directors that they weren't talking about nukes. And even once I did, they still didn't even think this was worthy of action. I mean, the redacted would probably have me hang for treason if they ever find me, but it was worth the risk. And by what I can gather, sounds like Russia thinks so too. Loaning you half the Pacific fleet and all. The interview continued after this point, but the rest of the conversation was considered irrelevant and stricken from the official file. The interview left the Foundation with more questions than answers, though they were more certain than ever that SCP-741 must be kept under strict containment procedures. Due to the object's location at the bottom of the sea, as well as the unusually elevated pressure around it, it is unlikely that many civilians will come into contact with it. 
However, as an extra protective measure, sonar and submersible monitoring is conducted on a periodic basis in order to verify that the wreckage has not been interfered with in any way. The Foundation contracted Russian warships, SCP Spasisti and Krasnoyarsk, has been selected for this purpose. If any unauthorized activity occurs in the area surrounding SCP-741, nuclear and conventional missiles may be deployed. Any movement of SCP-741 is grounds for an immediate nuclear strike. Whatever secrets SCP-741 holds, whatever it was transporting that was even more of an uncontrollable threat than nuclear warfare, they're better left alone down there, at the bottom of the sea. Violent chaos unfolds across the shoreline. Huge fleshy tendrils slither out of the water, grabbing people who try to flee and drag them into the depths as giant harpoons made of bone whiz across the beach, cutting down unfortunate sunbathers in droves. It is a terrifying massacre, but you'd never in a million years be able to guess its source. On April 10th, 2010, something strange began to happen in the three Portlands. Now, the anomalous extra-dimensional city-state that overlaps with the locations of Portland, Oregon, Portland, Maine, and the Isle of Portland is no stranger to unusual occurrences. So it took the population a little while to notice that something was happening. But for some unknown reason, sailboats and motorboats were beginning to vanish from the city. The disappearances occurred overnight, when there was no one around to witness them. But slowly, the citizens began to notice that their friends and family members were going out in their watercrafts and never returning home. By April 15th, the civilians were becoming noticeably concerned, fearing the worst. On April 16th, their worst fears were confirmed when two local ghosts, Ankar Ahmed and Greg Moore, went for a nighttime stroll along the harbor. They heard a sudden commotion and rushed to the scene of the disturbance. They arrived just in time to see a living individual being dragged into the watery depths by a large, vein-like tendril. Ahmed asked Greg to wait on land while he ventured out into the water to look for the victim. Unfortunately, Ahmed never came back, and Greg took his story to the Three Portlands Police Department. After waiting a few days for the local man-eating clam populace to migrate, the FBI Unusual Incidents Unit mounted a formal investigation. On the morning of April 17th, all of the missing vehicles suddenly reappeared. This left the UIU and the people of the city with even more questions. Where had all the boats gone? Why were they suddenly back? And what had happened to the missing people who had not been returned along with them? On April 19th, UIU agents dove into the harbor to search for any unusual activity, and while they didn't spot anything especially strange, they did discover that there were fewer animals in the harbor than usual. On April 21st, the threat that had been preying on the citizens of Three Portlands actually made itself known. At 11.19 a.m., 17 boats moved away from the docks on their own, drifting up onto shore, though no one could be seen captaining any of them. As the boats lined up, they began to form a wall blocking access to the water. No one could get in or out. Civilians watched in shock as the boats began to warp and change before their eyes, growing thick masses of scales on their surfaces, sprouting harpoon guns that fired bony projectiles, and slashing veiny tendrils at anyone within reach. The citizens began to panic, running in every direction in an attempt to escape the monstrous boats. But they were too slow to evade the attacks, and the boats snatched them off of the shore and yanked them aboard, using their harpoons to impale those who managed to run farther than the tendrils could stretch. As the army of fleshy boats closed in around the shore, a tugboat broke through the surface of the water. Unlike the rest of the boats, it had a noticeable hole in its hull and was missing its wheelhouse. At an unnaturally quick pace, the tugboat began to advance onto land, using its tendrils to drag itself along the shore and into the more populous part of town. It grabbed civilians at random, absorbing their blood into its metallic surface as it went. Suddenly, it spotted Albert Izzat, a noted member of the Church of the Broken God, and began to focus its attack on him. But before the tugboat monster could reach Izzat, a city security golem interfered. Sadly, though the golem put up a valiant fight, the anomaly was able to destroy it by falling onto it again and again until the golem was no longer able to get back up. There are few creatures that would survive having a boat drop itself on top of them repeatedly 
and sadly the security golem was not one of them. With the golem out of the way, the boat continued to drag itself through the streets wildly, crashing through the side of a local restaurant where its owner, an entity known as the Gruel, was in the middle of a busy brunch service. At the sight of the invading watercraft, the Gruel set down his pitcher of bottomless mimosas, wiped his hands on his apron, and grabbed his trusty dual-wield swords from underneath the counter. He kept them there in case someone attempted to dine and dash, but he figured they would do just fine against a blood-drinking tugboat. While the Gruel kept the tugboat busy, UIU forces were able to break through the barricade of boats for a brief period of time, allowing more security golems to enter the area, as well as allowing more citizens to escape. Unfortunately, this little victory was short-lived as further unforeseen horrors drudged themselves up from the deep. The reanimated corpses of various species native to the harbor began to crawl out of the water, surrounding the gruel and allowing the tugboat to escape the fight. As it made its way back to the harbor, every boat it passed attempted to toss bodies onto the tugboat, covering it in fresh blood. Slowly but surely, the damage to the tugboat began to repair itself. Once the boat had regained its strength, it set its sights on a previously untouched cargo ship. An observing UIU officer determined that the boat was somehow attempting to convert the cargo ship to transform it into another one of its fleshy allies. But before the transformation could take place, a cargo crate broke open, spilling over 1,000 hardtack crackers. Suddenly, the tugboat stopped everything that it was doing. It took one tendril and began to count each individual cracker that had spilled out. While the tugboat was distracted with its task, a citizen offered the UIU use of their Rare Metals Cannonball collection in the fight to apprehend the aggressive boat. One particular cannonball, made from Electrum, was able to puncture the hull of one of the infected ships, rendering it motionless. They were elated to have found a weapon that worked against these boats. While the tugboat continued to count, the remaining townspeople gathered all of the Electrum they could find and began to fight back against the boats. One by one, the boats sank, and all the while the tugboat continued to count. In the meantime, UIU officers managed to free the gruel from his zombie attackers. They presented him with an Electrum cannonball, which he proceeded to punch finger holes into and wield like a bowling ball. Then the gruel had a score to settle. No one, whether human, ghost, or tugboat, was going to mess with his brunch. The gruel barreled towards the harbor, grabbed hold of the still distracted tugboat, and punched it hard with his cannonball fist. If the tugboat could breathe, the punch would have knocked the air out of its lungs. The gruel then threw the tugboat out of the water and continued the savage beating, before preparing to destroy the battered vehicle once and for all. He lifted it up into the air, jumped up to follow it, and hit it with so much force that the tugboat careened through the air, colliding with a portal that had transported it to the Isle of Portland. Luckily, this portal could only be unlocked via a high-speed impact from a water-based vehicle. Speaking of luck, an SCP Foundation team was returning to the Isle from a failed mission just as the anomalous boat appeared in their reality. The object was knocked unconscious by the impact of its travel and the beating from the gruel, and in its incapacitated state, it was transported to a nearby Foundation site. There it was contained and given the designation of SCP-6426. Due to its anomalous traits, including the consumption of blood, a talent for hypnosis, and a compulsive counting habit, it was also given the nickname The Vampire Boat. SCP-6426 is a Keter-class sapient hostile entity that, in an inactive state, bears the appearance of a harbor tugboat in a constant state of rust and degradation. Any blood or organs containing blood that come into contact with the boat will be absorbed through the metal, causing the degradation to visibly improve as a result. The most effective blood appears to come from humans, cetaceans, and a few specific species of salations. The entity does not only use the absorbed blood to improve its appearance, but is also capable of using it to create organic additions to its body, including the vein-like tendrils spotted in the three Portlands, cognitohazardous eyes attached to bending eye stalks, harpoon guns, and cannons capable of firing ammunition made from anomalous species of barnacles. These barnacles are capable of reanimating dead tissue on contact, and SCP-6426 frequently uses them to create instances of SCP-6426-C. 
masses of reanimated tissue that the boat uses to aid in its attacks or self-defense. SCP-6426 uses its tendrils to grab prey and drag them towards itself, but the tendrils serve an additional purpose as well. Each of the tendrils has a mouth on the tip, similar in structure to that of the North American medicinal leech. When the tendril has made contact with its prey, the mouth will then bite into the spinal column of the creature, causing its brain function to cease as its canines grow long and hollow, hard scales form on their skin, and their muscle mass and bone density increase. Once they have been transformed in this way, organisms taken by SCP-6426 are designated SCP-6426-A. These instances are used to the entity's advantage, helping it to extract blood from victims at a distance, as well as providing an additional line of defense and offense. In the event that SCP-6426 encounters another watercraft, it is able to use SCP-6426-A to convert the vehicle into an instance of SCP-6426-B. These converted boats are similar to SCP-6426 and are able to function on their own. However, they are unable to produce their own eye stocks or cannons, unable to create SCP-6426-A instances, and do not appear to be as intelligent as their creator. In the early days of its containment, the exact nature of the anomaly's intelligence was the subject of debate amongst the research staff. However, on one specific occasion, the Foundation was able to establish a line of direct communication with SCP-6426 and conduct the first, and so far the only, interview with the vampiric tugboat. The inciting incident occurred when the arrival of the Foundation's latest hardtack shipment was delayed, leaving the boat with nothing to count and nothing to keep it occupied. Freed from the bounds of counting, it managed to escape and grab hold of several Foundation staff members with its tendrils. After chasing the boat through the site, guards were able to corner it, prompting the boat to absorb the bodies it had taken and use the organic material to produce a siren that emitted the sound of a human voice. It is through this siren that SCP-6426 responded to interview questions, using the voice of one of its victims. Junior researcher Sajad Williamson, in spite of his protests, was selected to conduct the interview. His fellow staff members refused to take no for an answer, and as the newest hire, the unpleasant job fell on his shoulders. Much to everyone's surprise, the anomaly began the conversation rather politely, saying, I am so sorry. I thought you were those self-righteous lunatics from the church. I apologize profusely for any trouble I may have caused, and I want to point out I fully support your mission. Yes, our first line of defense against the undersea menace. I am more than willing to punch sharks. Salations, yes, right. <laughs> How rude of me, yes. Dr. Williamson's first question concerned SCP-6426 apparent intended victim back in Three Portlands, Albert Izzat. SCP-6426 responded, Albert? His first name is really Albert. <laughs> well, what other relationship is there to say besides the hunter and the hunted? Admiral Izzat is a ruthless man, known for terrorizing and slaughtering people like me. He was leading a search party of those barbaric nautophiles, intending to gut me like a seal. What do you mean, people like you? Dr. Williamson inquired. Free thinkers, of course. People who are unafraid to break from the mold to carve their own path in life instead of following the predetermined route set by that ignorant check valve. The church is built upon a foundation of lies. No one's really a petty officer on this ship. We're all just cabin boys stumbling around in the dark as we follow the commands of an offhand COB. <laughs> If you want real power, real freedom, all you have to do is listen for the call of the beast. Open the portal and he'll squeeze you right through. <laughs> Dr. Williamson, feeling rather in over his head, attempted to convince one of his colleagues to take over. When he refused, however, Dr. Williamson continued, um, <clears throat> Could you explicate your activities within the harbor and how you arrived there? Well, after I got the Botswans off my trail, I found a cave to hide in. I was forced to hide in, yes, forced to hide deep in the cave, which turned out to be a tunnel. Surprisingly, the tunnel led to some coastal community where I took refuge, licking my wounds in the safety of the depths 
as those zealots stalk the surface. I spent my time preparing, gathering the strength necessary to face them once more, until I was ambushed, assaulted within my hideout by a botswain. I fought for my life as I was forced out into the open and descended upon by a manner of monsters and freaks of this orchestrated by that scumbag Izzard. I was beaten within an inch of my life before. I'm not quite sure what happened after that. I believe I was knocked unconscious. You'll have to illuminate me on how I came to be in your custody. At this point, the interview began to veer in an odd direction. The boat expressed confusion about the nature of Williamson's questions, specifically how little they related to the subject of sharks and punching them. It was at this point that the site director sought guidance from the Multi-U department. A researcher there informed Williamson about the confusion. SCP-6426 had mistaken the SCP Foundation for another organization, the Shark Punching Center. Dr. Williamson resumed the interview, prepared to play along and keep the boat comfortable. Unfortunately, Williamson was a terrible liar. Yes, we are the Shark Punching Center. We will determine if you are a suitable candidate to carry out the mission. To search, punch, and contain sh <clears throat> I mean salations. This verbal misstep caused SCP-6426 to become suspicious. After a moment, it pieced together the truth and began to throw itself against the wall in a desperate attempt to escape. It was apprehended by security guards, who impaled it with a naval ram and returned the watercraft to its containment cell. The exact reason for its apparent fear and hatred of the Foundation is currently unknown, and the boat has made no attempt to speak since. Currently, SCP-6426 is kept in a 39 meter by 39 meter by 50 meter containment chamber. Beneath the chamber, there is an artificial lava tube. The tugboat has a naval ram through its hull and engine, holding it in place. This ram is checked daily for signs of degradation, as it is the primary force keeping the anomaly immobile. If the ram is ever removed or damaged somehow, a failsafe system will activate, releasing 100 hardtack crackers and two pieces of electrum into the containment chamber. This is intended to keep the tugboat occupied until the naval rod can be replaced. If for some reason the naval rod fails and the boat runs out of hardtack to count, well, there will be nowhere on water or land that we can hide. Now go check out SCP-1861, the crew of the HMS Wintersheimer, and SCP-4217, Contain the Bismarck, for more.